where I put on fat, and I don't care for live, is <laughs> I get I get the side meat, right? Yep. And so I'll you know I'll be working out for like a couple weeks or whatever, and I'll, and I'll look straight on and I'll feel good. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is working on because like I don't not as much in the stomach area, and then I turn sideways and it's like, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Look up that number for cool sculpting. Cool sculpting? You know about that? Yeah. yeah. They freeze your fat, right? Well, it's like you see some of these stars, like some of these guys like post 40, you look at them and you're like, yeah, they're like, oh, they look really cut. Like, yeah, their abdominals look cut, but everything else looks a little bit hubby. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing that terrifies me is anytime you do liposuction or, or, or freezing the fat, like that en the body still needs to store excess energy and <laughs> it just finds weirder other places. It, it can, but also it's like you have part of the problem. is like, like if, if you put on a lot of weight, you increase the number of fat cells you have and they never go away. So in theory, I, well, I, th know, I thought you just... always had the same number of fat cells. Uh, and then they either just, you know, ballooned up or ballooned down. My understanding is they divide. It's muscle cells that don't, unless you use like human growth hormone or something like mm. that. I'm not an expert. I don't know. So yeah, yeah what is this? What is this? Knowledgeable things? Well, what yeah, is this? Doctor no. things? Hell no. Doctor things. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Doctor Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Have you acclimatized yourself to the way we do things in America yet again? You, uh, uh, you were world weary traveler. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm, 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 I'm rocking and rolling. I'm, I've, uh, availed myself of, uh, America's, uh, varied fruits, like brunch, <laughs> football. Uh. But no, 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 it's been, uh, it's been good. It actually kind of like, today was one of those days where like Ashley didn't have to work. And so we have like these downstairs neighbors. So we like went out to dinner and like had a good time. And it's like, oh man, like I have to work. I, I still have to do all these things. That like, and and then there's there's definitely no way that I can push anything off because Monday's the day that like this is like the last of my first days back, mm -hmm. like because uh, we came back on a Tuesday. So got to get these the the, the got to be here for Monday. Of course. Yeah. Oh shoot! I'm tweeting. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Just in case you were wondering. Nice. Um, I believe last week Andrew. Oh, that's right. We pushed a. Uh, we pushed the email. Yeah, we got an email for after things. So we thought we'll wait for Justin to be here. Yeah. Nice. Um, but then also, in the middle of that, I remembered we had a second one. So I'm gonna send that over to you now. And if we get to it this week or next, that's fine. So, uh, guess what's the number 28 book in the country right now? And, uh -oh. and number one book in amateur sleuths. And number three, number three in science fiction, number by three. the way. That's wow. great. And and uh, uh, this is, uh, wait, different from the previous launch? Or this is the, the physical copy only? Or what's different? Well, physical, there, there's been... Um, they, well, I mean, it's like, and actually physical books, it's, uh, I don't know how it's ranking there because they're selling all over. But anyhow, number three right now in all books, number three in, in Kindle, in science fiction, in that category, in all books, it's like 28. Dude, Kindle. that's great. Incredible. So, all right. Kind of groovy. I'm next to, uh, right now in science fiction books, I'm next, I'm right between Weir and Klein? Just, That's you know, great! How cool! Yeah, it's, it's just a thing, you know. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, couldn't happen to a better book. It's uh, we, we've mentioned this before that, but the Naturalist is my favorite of everything you've done. Thank you very much, sir. Note to Brain: Send advanced copy of the sequel to Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I am good to go whenever you guys are. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Unless you guys want to talk about the Yelp reviews for Linda Tripp's ornament store in Virginia. Oh, my God. Is this a thing? 
This is a real thing. Linda Tripp sells homemade ornaments, and I found the Yelp page. You want to, just just real quick? Do you want to just guess the star rating on Linda Tripp's ornaments? Uh, one, two, four, uh, three, 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 three stars uh, on sixteen reviews, including one. This is my favorite. All that said, said, said that the owner was so rude. Asking personal questions that she. Uh, <laughs> 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 now, it might be her husband because her and her husband run it. Uh, and there's other reviews of there being a guy who's creepy. But I like to imagine that it's Linda Tripp still all up in people's business, even when they're buying her own. <laughs> That's amazing. Are you good to go, Andrew? Good to go. All right. Take it away in three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. That is a fact. That is true. Welcome to True Things. Uh, what's his face? Some, some, and our and our producer, Mr. Bryce Castillo. <laughs> okay. I, I, I feel like uh, the over. gang's all together. You, me, Bryce. Bryce. The other guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, other, guy. other guy. Uh, no, hey. man, we got, we got a world hey, traveler. Hey, guys. Did you... <laughs> Hey, did, went did, out did, for a pack of cigarettes in yeah. Tokyo. Did you did you miss me? I was gone from the show for a while. Now I'm back. Uh, tell us about your journey, man. It's Justin it's Robert I, Young. That's who it is. Hey, Chris. I'm back. Yes. Uh, uh, no, uh, Japan was amazing. Uh, Japan was great, and and it's it put a lot of uh, a lot of stories into context because uh, uh, Andrew. Yeah, used to tell me, uh, you know, stories of his uh, uh, trips to Japan, and I cannot, I cannot imagine being in that country, not only without ubiquitous, not only without internet, but without ubiquitous on the phone internet. Like we got ourselves into jams, and we had a device in our hands that could literally live translate uh, 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 street signs by because of Google Translate. I can't imagine. Dealing uh, with with uh, w without those kinds of tools. I mean, in a pre-internet era, a trip to Japan, uh, especially if if you weren't very wealthy, if you just went to see what it was like, I, I mean, that would feel like an alien civil civilization, a place where you can't read or write or talk to other people. Or... Now imagine living there as I did. <laughs> uh, how long did you place. live there? Half a year. Wow. That's amazing. I'm so jealous. I'm sad that I'm the last person here. You probably already been to Japan, Bryce. Yeah, but I'll never be able to grow up in I'm Norway. Not. Okay. Well, then hopefully I'll get there before you. <laughs> I, I'll do that before I die, damn it. <laughs> Brian well, just walks out things. of frame. We hear the sound of the door and a car squealing. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick text. Uh, Sayonara, put some TV dinners in the oven for the kids. Exactly. Now, listen, at one point, Brian's just not going to be here. We're going to find out that Bryce booked a trip to Japan in six months. Yeah. And so he has to go immediately. <laughs> no. It becomes a cannonball run to get to Japan yeah. for bragging rights. <laughs> Uh, no, listen, it was uh, uh, Japan is an amazing country. There is so much that is similar and obviously so much that is very, very different. The, the biggest thing, though, and, and uh, it's hard to overhype it, is, is the, the, the trains. The trains. They're just uh, – there's so many of them. They're so on time. They don't smell like urine. They move a million people. Like, it's just crazy. They were amazing. Yeah, the bullet train. I remember my my experience of the bullet train was going to the bullet train station, walking out on the platform and standing here kind of just waiting, waiting, waiting. And, and I'm the only one close to the edge of the platform, which should have should have told me something. You know, everybody yeah. else a little further away from this. And an express went through. Which oh, like like a concussive <laughs> so a just bullet blast train go through really fast and i'm just a couple feet away from the platform and boom. <laughs> i'm like i just turned to everybody else i was where I, I was doing a magic show there was, was a bunch of dancers i just turned to them and i'm like <laughs> mouth wide open like you can do that here <laughs> oh yeah no it was, it was wild i mean we were it was like an hour and a half from tokyo to nagano which shaves about uh, i think it's like an hour, 45 minutes from, from what it would be otherwise. It's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah. What so, was your, uh, two, two biggest takeaways for the things that surprised you? Two biggest takeaways. Number one, uh, uh, culture difference. 
uh, smoking outside illegal, which means smoking inside very prevalent. <laughs> Uh, and that's something that I, I, I was not uh, uh, ready for. It's something that kind of affects you on, on, a, on, on a daily basis. Uh, the second was really just in, in general, there is uh, uh, a little bit less of like basically there is a, a, an exact opposite of whatever you would imagine needs to go into a culture to produce somebody slapping a taxi and saying I'm walking here. Right. It's the inverse <laughs> of that. Is, is is Japanese culture. It is very non-confrontational, but as I learned talking with more people, very judgy, but very non-confrontational. So it's like yeah. you are always being watched. And, and I guess, you know, foreigners get kind of an excuse for not knowing all the rules to the hokey pokey, but uh, uh, there's, there's definitely just uh, uh, culture differences that are constantly being monitored. Non-confrontational makes me feel like it's this uh, social blockchain where it's just like your punishment is that this goes on your whispered record behind the scenes. Effectively. And, and you know, the, 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 uh, I started digging into stuff uh, like, well, like the, the smoking, for example. There is a huge paradox between smoking rates in Japan and lung cancer rates. Like there's, it, it is, uh, uh, they are less likely to get it than Americans who smoke the same amount of cigarettes. It's a weird thing. It's oh, it's a good thing we're talking about on this on this podcast. But it's just something that that exists. Now, inversely, if you look at suicide rates, they're almost double what they are in America, and mm -hmm. and the rest of Europe. And if I were to totally pop sociology kind of guess part of uh, of why is because I think that there is. You know, your 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 whispered record is something that is a, a real thing. That there is there is social capital that is uh, managed by your reputation. And if you screw up, or you know, then, or you feel like you're screwed, like you've screwed up, then I think that that pressure can be tremendous. Yeah, in America, if a teacher yells at you in class, uh, the parents sue the school. In Japan, teacher yells at you at class, your kid is on suicide watch. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it it sounds. Like I'm being harsh. It's actually part of it. It's 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 the trade offs, you know, and it's a trade offs. And I, I I lived there, enjoyed it, loved the people and all that. But it's a very, very different sort of thing. And, and that's we have to often ask. We go, oh, I love it over here in this country like that may be great. But there are trade offs there. And, and maybe those trade offs are better, you know, but there often yeah. very much are there are differences there. And, you know, gender disparities there, you know, it, it is it is, you know, we clearly have a sexism problem here. And, you know, watching the whole Me Too thing unfold just makes you realize, man, like how much we just, how much we ignore that goes on around us. You know, you go to other cultures where that's just inconceivable. They wouldn't even, why are women complaining? You know, sort of mentality. <laughs> which, right. I will also say, man, some of those anime girls look young. I'm just, <laughs> man, hey, some of these, I'm just, some, I mean, uncomfortably young, some but, of these anime girls. But like, I remember, oh, I remember sitting on, sitting on the train and looking across me, this businessman, this, you know, normal, good suit, you know, guy going to business suitcase. I'm going to business, reading a comic. I'm like, oh, cool. He's reading comics. It's kind of cool. So I love Japan. And I looked and it was like one of the, one of the really rapey anime, you know, or manga, pardon me, manga, you know, and I'm like, Huh. This is interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. So yeah, my my everything that I needed to learn, and again, I again, it is an amazing, wonderful culture. But I remember I turned on the TV one night and I see this quit this game show. And there's like six or eight guys sitting down at desks trying to do math problems, right? They're trying to do there's time trying to do math problems. And you're like, oh, it's kind of interesting. This is like that's why they're so good at math. And then a girl comes out, takes off her blouse, and rubs her breasts in their faces as they're trying to do math problems. I'm like, huh, now I really know why they're good at math. And I also know why there's some kind of uh, some gender imbalances here because this is considered okay, you know? And but uh there, that was, there was a real a, show. Uh, that was a real show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a fantastic uh, uh, lecture that I took at uh, Wizard Academy where they were talking about the difference between introverted and extroverted societies. Wait, wait, back up. Wizard, wait, wait, wait. Wizard Academy? Oh, dude. Wizard Academy is the jam. It's uh, 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 You don't find it. It finds you. Uh, it's a business. Uh, they, they have business classes and stuff. Um, 
Uh, I, I, when are you in Austin? I should take you out there. Um, but uh, uh, they. Uh, wait, 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 no, back up. Back what? Up. What? What? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I just got to, you know, get business school, business class, you know, Wizard Academy. <laughs> yeah, it was founded by, it was founded, uh, uh, this isn't some guy's basement? No, know? no, it's a wizard tower. I mean, I guess. No, 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 oh, right, wizard so, tower. So here, hold on. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, yeah. let me try to bridge, because Brian's talking about Wizard Academy a lot, and I think you're, you're just like, well, yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, I've talked about it a million times. I don't need to talk yeah, about how much I love it again, but Andrew has no idea. So here's what it is. It is this. Gorgeous, uh, uh, like castle basically out in the hill country of Austin around where Brian's house is. And they do a ton of seminars and some regular classes, but uh, it's by and large just a bunch of cool people that they do these like you know longer form, multiple day seminars and stuff. Yeah, and and uh, of course, friends of the the show of the Modern Rogue uh, run a channel called uh, uh, the Whiskey uh, Vault, and uh, they have actually. Uh, they they started in the last couple of years doing the uh, world's first uh, whiskey sommelier program, uh, or I guess the first in the United States, and uh, it's it's great. It's a lot of fun. But in the class, uh, we were talking about the difference between introverted and extroverted societies, and how you can kind of see introversion extroversion just across America. Because the farther west you go, the more as a biological safety net it is to to be extroverted. Because when you when you uh, plant your flag in the ground, you walk over the three miles to meet your neighbor because you're way out there and you're going to need their help at some point. And so you 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 know it's it's a, a tactical advantage. You know, whereas uh, a lot of places that are more crowded, especially in the east, uh, you know, tend to be more introverted. But specifically, he was bringing up Japan, where uh, the society as a whole is so introverted. That's what, you know, like you'll be packed in like sardines on a bullet train, but nobody will say a word. Everybody is enjoying their own privacy, quiet time and stuff. Uh, and then the flip side is, you know, w when you want to balance the scales, they have uh, that's part of why, why karaoke happens because you have a little booze and then you you bust out and get to you know extrovert for a little bit is the way he represented it anyway uh yeah it's a great time. i see that difference i've described you know we're talking i to me like i sort of said japan to me a lot was a lot like sort of like salt lake city mm -hmm. you know but yeah. but the yeah, the introversion there is that everybody's in the little bubble it's why they can be you know it is that you that how do you get pushed into this you know, put thousand people in one car or whatever like this, you just tune everything out, you know, and it is, I would say the people were super, super polite though and willing to help though. I'd be, I'd be oh. walking downtown Tokyo and like totally lost, like, and somebody come up, speak perfect English. Oh, can I help you out? You know? Um, but my, yeah. my favorite, what's that? Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, we had multiple people come and just, just, understand that these wayward foreigners uh, uh, just needed to be pointed in the right direction, uh, specifically early on. And, and I would say, too, like, my experience in New York City, anytime I stopped or asked somebody for, hey, can you help, everybody help me, You the, the, the body language is don't bother me, but like, hey, I'm lost, you know where such and such is? Like, oh, yeah, it's over here, da-da-da. Okay. That was my experience, <laughs> and, too. And like, I know it's always meant in a positive way, but I have never been told more often what I ought to do than, than when I spend time in New York City. <laughs> it's like, it was like, well, the, the burger joint's over there, but what you ought to do is always yeah. constantly. Yeah. yeah, and that is that is it is a weird sort of uh, dichotomy because like you go to a big city like New York, you're, you're like, oh man, everybody just everybody's trying to get to where they're going, and you're just afraid, and they're like, hey, can you help me find this? And if they can't have time, like, sorry, no time. But somebody else is like, oh yeah, da 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 da, and you're like, oh, like we're just in our own little zone. But if I tell them I need help or whatever, strangers have been extremely, you know, helpful there, um, which you know is 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 one of the things once you get over that. Uh, I, I thought what was interesting, too, was like the host culture and like you go to a, like a shop in the middle of nowhere and they'll sit you down, pour you tea and all this, which is sort of and not even speak the same language. But that was interesting. Well, of course, there is also the host. Oh, the host host, host culture. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, I found out uh, uh, Bryce is missing. A, a tremendous windfall uh, of, of being a host. We, in we explored this a little bit on Night Attack this past week. You can see some of the photoshops if you look at the Night Attack Twitter feed. Uh, but yeah, it does look like uh, Bryce was uh, was born just on the wrong side of the planet. Yeah, no, because I'm I'm walking down the street and I just keep seeing these billboards, and I'm like, all these guys look like 
Bryce. Like they have like very Bryce like features and Bryce adjacent hair. <laughs> <laughs> and the the this billboards <laughs> the billboards just look like models like i would say it looks like a, a super group boy band or that's maybe... what i thought i i initially thought it was like a boy band and i'm like oh my god look at this all these people look like bryce and so i put it in the discord and <laughs> bryce is like yeah they're hookers and it's like <laughs> well I mean, technically not but also maybe <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> More well, less. I mean, given the, the past history of Lou Pearlman's boy bands and what's gone on there, that's not really that much of a difference. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, so but th that's that's a whole thing. I mean, there's there's a just another element of society there. And, and, and specifically, uh, I think, you know, relative to what Brian was saying in the, like why a communal activity like karaoke is so popular. There's also just the idea of I want companionship of somebody to talk about. Or somebody to talk about my day, talk about my life. And it would be better if it was somebody that I found attractive. And, and you know, it kind of comes back to the idea of, of the, the, the snuggle cafe from oh so many uh, uh, episodes snuggery, ago. Yeah. Of the, 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 the snuggery that, uh, you know, at, at some point it's like there is a price to be paid for companionship. There, there, is, a, there is a drive. There is a genre of entertainment that is please make me feel like a human. Well, which brings me to our first topic. Uh, you see the uh, what caught a lot of attention, the biggest thing that probably got out of CES? Uh, no, I, I have a feeling <laughs> that I can guess now that for that, that lead up, the biggest I, thing. I would, in my estimation of what got, I saw more coverage people talking about wasn't actually really a product. It was more of a demo, and that was the sex bots on display at oh. the strip club. That's right. They were bad dancers. Everyone was disappointed because they weren't sexy enough. <laughs> They're like, boo, I don't want to have sex with that. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, other people had a different re reaction, Brian. You know, like some, I think people were expecting like full on fembots from Westworld or whatever. Right. But yeah. uh, they had the pole dancing robots at CES. And uh, I would say we've come a long ways, though. But yeah, they're just they don't do a lot of movement there. And if you can find some video of the movement there, though, but you just sort of they just do one thing. And if you're expecting like, you know, right. Like, if it, you, you, yeah. you're, you're not going to get a multi-phase dance. Routine, Evan Rachel would, you know, no. Yeah, um, exactly. Although well, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the John Henry to this inky poo. <laughs> when uh, the the this is an an art piece. She dies from out dancing the bot. <laughs> from out dancing the bot in the <laughs> humanity's last yeah. day. She's, <laughs> she's like, I did it for you. Sorry, Bryce. What were you saying? Uh, so so this was an an art piece that apparently was at CES uh, five years ago or so. And was was partially a big deal because it was back at CES. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so, so robot yeah. strippers is what they call them, robot strippers. But there was also a lot of other. There's also been a lot of developments now in the whole robot sex doll. You see a lot more coverage, at least on Matt Drudge, which, you know, the Drudge Report. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Reflex says something else. Forward. I don't know. But um, uh, we're you know sooner. I mean, they already have like remember years ago the real doll. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we're getting to the point that these things are going to become more prevalent. Well, and uh, uh, think about, I mean, I don't want to make it too salacious, but like with with the addition of VR, that was the that was what I thought you were going to bring up is all the new VR stuff that was announced. But like uh, for people who want to treat uh, sex like going number three. Uh, you can strap on a VR set and have strap a doll, on. and then that's the that aspect. You don't have, have to think about it. <laughs> I would explain why the Oculus controller looks like it does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's certainly a direction we're going to there, and it's one of these things that we'll see what happens to to, to what degree, how fast do these things happen, you know. Um, but. Anyhow, well, I thought I that was the, kind the, of interesting. The, the, there was so much coverage for those, you know, mannequin legs. <laughs> <laughs> they really were. <laughs> well, it's like, just because people, number one, uh, uh, covering CES, uh, I have never done it myself, but uh, uh, as it has been described to me, can be a bit of a drudgery. And there's only so many times you can report specs for televisions or uh, list how many voice assistants this uh, pencil uh, sharpener has. Uh, before you just want to shoot yourself. So the idea that you can like 
use your company card to go to Sapphires and write about the robot, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the robot strippers is something that I'm sure was very exciting for many reporters. Sure. Oh, we got a mute. Cough button. You, you coughed to sneeze. Yeah. It's- uh, in Gadget as a headline, there's a new sex robot in town. Say hello to Solana. <laughs> say, say, um, move over, Fleshlight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, the the I gotta say the editor in chief of In Gadget, his hair is on point. Um, it's uh, quite luxurious. I can see if you can see this. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Harmony and Solana, hands on. Uh, he does have a gorgeous hair. Fabio esque. Uh, I am here. Reminds with me of the kids in the hall sketch where they the, the guys who work in the the auto shop and they've got the one guy with the luxurious care and it's all the source of pride for them. <laughs> the next to him is Fred Armisen testing out a new character. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> quite possibly the first sex robot to hit the market. So, if you told me that these two were the postal service, I'd believe it. <laughs> been a bit over a year since the I band <laughs> yeah. and you've made some improvements to harmony what are we going to see today um well i wanted to demo how easily an end user could actually change uh the face on the robot so you would you'd be able to have multiple characters um so not only changing the face but now understand also we're just looking at the head and cleavage not even uh, boobs yeah it's uh, uh i'm I, it's really disturbing sort of strange um but I guess they're they're showing off just individual parts. Right, and you're going to be showing us another female face today. Correct. Uh, as well as a female avatar, but you do have plans, and you're in the in the works of making a male version of the of, of the doll. Yeah. So uh, had this event been a few weeks later, I Man. would have been able to bring a male head here. And so, so how much? Uh, that works. So that's really I, I, ostensibly. Out. Yeah, if, if you could make a case for um, uh, this is a healthy thing to uh, for people who don't have ongoing relationships to to fill the void or at least to to uh, feel. Be- oh God damn! <laughs> Sorry, I, they the just hair. peel off her face. I was unprepared. Now, for that. now as, as she sits there, she blinks. By the way, to like give you this sort of like yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so this is I, very Brian, sort of classic Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> my God! And, um, you can see that. Oh my God! The, uh, he just sort of rips it off like a like a mask, like a Halloween mask. Oh, it looks magnets, like a living and nightmare. Those corresponding magnets are inside of the face. Oh, so any kill it. And also, like the design, eyes still have the eyelashes on them, oh. which it just makes it look like Lady Skeletor. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever be able to kiss a real woman again either. I'd just be afraid that that's underneath. I know, I know. What have you been hiding, ladies? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that you're gonna see like like they have like I know in like the uh, when I say I know I don't no no everybody but like in the in the kind of the sort of just sit there sort of sex doll sort of you know environment like they have a number of them that like look like they do ones that look like famous porn stars and i'm sure there's going to be times where you're going to start getting you know mods you know the maya angelou whatever you know (laughs) (laughs) reads you reads you poetry i mean come on what would be what would be better than pillow talk with maya (laughs) uh she's like i found that people will never forget how i make them feel i'm maya angelou lay down (laughs) oh god (laughs) Point is, is that like I think we're, there was. Uh, did you? Did we? I sent a link. Did we do the thing about how somebody they're able to like take like porn and map other people's faces? Yeah, yeah. On, uh, yes, using machine learning, the story was um, they they fed in a bunch of pictures of Gal Gadot, and uh, uh, basically machine learning did a pretty good facsimile of her opening up a uh, a, a sex toy. Um, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and that was one of the things we've talked about here before is that as it becomes possible to like put cameras and invade people's privacy everywhere, it's also becoming easier. You can also create these fakes. And the bad news with the fakes is that, you know, we're we could be weeks away from like a Brian Brushwood sex tape. But I mean, I already have the mustache for it. Brian can claim it's digital, it's faked, and now people will believe it. Not like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I won't name a certain boxer who they got, you know, <laughs> dressed up as a woman, Woo! insisted it was a fake. <laughs> it's Photoshop. Yeah. Photoshop. Can't Photoshop those fishnets, dog. Yeah. 
Um, uh, what the yeah. other curious thing is that the the recourse to get rid of of leaked stuff is to claim copy, copyright. Like that's my property; you have to take it off. But in the case of somebody making a fake about you, I guess on the one side you get to say that's definitely a fake. Uh, but meanwhile, like you don't get to say take it down. That's my that's my likeness. That's my image. It's all like so what? None of that matters. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see because that is. Yeah, that'll be an interesting area to see if that you could use likeness, but but the problem, of course, is like you could say, "Hey, take it down," but in the internet, great, it's not going to be on an official site, but it'll be somewhere. But right. but if the idea, if you have start having a flood of these fakes and things like this, you don't know what to believe. Like when they had the fappening, you know, there's stuff out there. Oh, this came from there. And I was like, Photoshop was fake, but you just don't know. And I think it'll get to a point where nobody will care. In the chat, they're asking, what about life rights? Well, I mean, the obvious thing they would do is say it's not about, you know, like, oh, this is uh, this is not about Gal Gadot. This is about uh, Shal Shallow, totally fictional person. It's a, a totally unique property, like Ricky Rouse yep. or Monald Muck. Yep. It's going to be curious. Um, so uh, we're going to talk Zuma. Oh well, uh, I'll tell you what. Before before we get into that, well, I, well, I don't know what all you guys got into uh, last week, but apparently all sorts of uh, you know, stuff going on Twitter over the last seven days. But first, let's remind everybody that you can support this show by going to Patreon.com/slash Weird Things and uh, uh, contributing to this fine program. No matter what, we're making these episodes for you, even if one of the co-hosts is a total flake and takes several weeks off for his own whims in Japan. Well, uh, this show keeps a rolling. Thanks to everybody who kicks in whatever they can at patreon.com slash weird things. Heck yes. Don't forget also, you get your special RSS feed so that you get a rock block. Not only weird things, but you get uh, after things all in one feed for you because you're special. And a day early. And a day early. Yeah. Uh, those RSS feeds, man, if you are a patron now and you're not taking advantage of it, you really should. They are the bomb. So go ahead and check it out. Patreon.com slash Weird things. All right. So Zuma, this was uh, apparently this. Uh, here's all I know based on just our Twitter or, or uh, uh, reactions that people had on Twitter was that you guys were like, well, look at this. Zuma uh, uh, went up. Uh, perfect. Everything's great. Isn't SpaceX amazing? And then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. Catch me up. What 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 the hell happened? So last week. SpaceX had a launch. It was like a week ago Sunday. They had a launch, and it was the secretive satellite, or secret payload. We don't even know what it is, called Zuma. Zuma, well, all we know that was officially announced about Zuma was SpaceX was launching it. Northrop Grumman had built the payload, and the client, we don't know who the client was. No, in an agency, they'd ask, like, you know, like the, the Pentagon is yours. It's like, no, and like you know, nobody wanted to admit to who it was. So it was a secret payload, presumably a satellite. Uh, SpaceX was supposed to provide the launch and the Northrop Grumman was providing the payload and they apparently built the adapter, which goes to the second stage, which is how the thing would then detach or go, whatever. Okay. SpaceX does part of the launch, covers part of the launch. They show part of the launch and they cut out at a certain point because they don't want to show, you know, the, the classified portion of it. And first stage comes back, does what it's supposed to be. The rest of the rocket goes up. Everything proceeds as far as there's everything supposed to be is supposed to go. There is an entries made into the catalog of orbital objects as this object is entered. Da 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 da. And SpaceX is like, all right, yay for us. All right, we're done. And then we covered it on Monday. We're like, yep, you know, looks like Zuma successful launch. I didn't look, no, Zuma was successful. Blah blah blah. Great job. And ho hum, you know, SpaceX landed another rocket. Well, then stories started to come out, like Wall Street Journal and other people, were like, oh no. Zuma and it was like SpaceX has a failure. Zuma is a failure. Rumors are that Zuma failed, that SpaceX failed. And you'd see these headlights. Um, and you'd say, like, here we are, Wall Street Journal. US spy said I believe lost after SpaceX mission fails. Okay. So you start hearing SpaceX failure, SpaceX failure. You don't hear Northrop Grumman. Nobody knows who that is, even like one of the biggest military sure. space contractors there but, is, right? But also, but, Northrop uh, Grumman uh, is is uh, them having a failure is not news, right? That that's happened a lot. Right. They put a lot of stuff up, and whereas SpaceX having a failure or anything that could be look like a, uh, I mean, that's that's newsworthy. Yeah, well, yeah, but it, it's inaccurate. Though. We right. don't know. The point is, is that the problem is like, yes, agreed. It, it, we use SpaceX because everybody knows what it is. Nobody knows what Northrop is, so they'll do like 
you know, oh, SpaceX failure. Like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe they effed up. We don't know. But, you know, it's one of these things where nobody wants to put Northrop in the title where that would appear to be, by all accounts, something happened to the payload and what we're hearing. Either either this is a really clever ruse in a few weeks' time, we're going to find out this thing actually made it to orbit because we don't know. We didn't see anything fall back down that wasn't supposed to. There's just been reports and reports. And one of the things you have is SpaceX did a – this was a big profile in the industry launch because it's a government payload, most maybe one of the most expensive payloads ever put into orbit – SpaceX has a variety of people that just do not like the company because they are losing business. They're losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year to SpaceX. SpaceX is the largest launch provider in the United States. Now it's actually the largest launch provider in the world. You have all these other companies that have access to grind over SpaceX. So the problem you have is there are things like they've blown up rockets. They've done mishaps. They've made mistakes, things like this, and they need to be held accountable for that. But you also get the long knives come out by people who are losing a lot of business to SpaceX that are ready to jump on anything. And you had a report here that it was all behind the scenes. Nobody was on the record saying anything. You know, uh, we had no, nobody would say on the record, would go on the record to say anything. So all we have is just, you know, Northrop saying, uh, we cannot comment on classified missions. Uh, it got to the point where Gwen Shotwell, who's president of SpaceX, came out and said, uh, as far as our things, SpaceX did exactly what it was supposed to do. Because so, that's the other part about this, is that this is a classified launch, mm -hmm. and there's only so much that people can legally say about these kinds of, uh, th th this kind of business. So you, what seems to be happening, without a doubt, as Andrew put it out, is that there is a lot of off the record, uh, uh, there, there, there's there's a lot of reading between the lines because SpaceX coming out and saying we've reviewed our logs, our logs say that everything we did was fine. If we get new data, we will update you. Seems like, you know, a a, a bound up version of what they I'm sure would love to go into more detail on of of exactly what they believe happened to this, or if they believe that this thing is up in uh in orbit right now so it's a mystery it, it is a mystery that, that it's one of these things that you would have to look to see if the falcon 9 failed if there was a problem there what happens is all these other launches get delayed and so they yeah. may you know they could do you, you you because if you think the hardware's got a problem that's what's happened before when they had their last explosion Guess what? There was delays. And then they had, you know, the, the one seat on the launch pad when that exploded. You know, there was delays. We had to figure out what's going on. Now, we're supposed to be doing a test of the Falcon Heavy tomorrow. They're going to be doing a test of firing of the engines on that. If that proceeds, I think that's a pretty good indication that NASA and the people behind the scenes who make this decision weren't worried about the SpaceX hardware. Um, and then if we continue on with Falcon 9 launches, which I think there's some coming up pretty soon. Let me see here. We've got... Another uh, January 30th, we've got a GovSat launch. So we've got, and then we've got 10th of February, another launch. So we've got a bunch of launches coming up. If those get pushed back, all of them, then maybe something, maybe there was, you know, a little splodiness. Uh, well, and the other weird part is if effectively the schedule is completely unaffected and they continue to, uh, you know, everyone's still booking and going, then whether or not it was lost or not lost, whether it's a government plot or not a government plot, whether or not uh, SpaceX uh, ever has to cop to the disaster or not uh, is irrelevant, right? Because as long as SpaceX still is getting all the business, sending everything all up, then it, it seems like it's still plowing forward. Yeah, I guess when it comes, you're right. And But it comes to when people want to play the, oh, the blame game. And to the to people who are like, ah, look at this, they screwed up. It's like, well, did they? Where's your, how do you how do you support that? And nobody can prove that they did. And again, if they did, then yeah, things got to be looked into. But it that comes kind of comes down to is answering the art. Because we had some of the response we had on Twitter, like, oh, no, they failed. And it's like, ah, maybe, but it, we don't know that. I don't know that. Well, we, and we don't know. Here, also, all right. Let's let's get into conspiracy corner, right? Like, let's say that this is a very, very top secret satellite that people want to believe that the government wants to believe our, our enemies to to uh, in general know that it never made it up there. So it's certainly not up there right now. If that happens, right, and all of a sudden they start leaking out that up, oh, turns out it didn't make it. 
uh, you know, uh, there must have been some problem between Northrop, uh, you know, uh, either Northrop Grumman or SpaceX. Like SpaceX just has to eat that, right? <laughs> like I, you wouldn't imagine that it necessarily would be like a coordinated thing. Like you're the government. Like, what are you gonna do? Tell the government, "Oh, you guys, you, you really made us look bad. We're, we're definitely not gonna take your money to launch stuff into space anymore." Like, SpaceX just has to sit on it. There's nothing they can do. Like, they legally can't say, according to all of our calculations, this thing went up into orbit. They they can just say what they've said, which is, we <laughs> all available data says we did our job, and we are barred from saying anything else so that is a factor of it and what's also you know there is some people like yeah maybe it is maybe it really is up there and, and there are people some of us like no you would we would know in a couple of weeks time like well a couple of weeks time can be a good advantage the other thing too is there was uh there was a satellite system called misty which we launched one like 1990 then one in 1999 which was a super secret space shuttle uh payload that there is reports like, oh, the first one broke up or whatever. Other people are like, no, that was actually they, re they released like chafe or other material or debris to make it look like it broke up because it would actually had a different orbital pattern. And there's now evidence to think like, yeah, they did a very clever clandestine thing for putting this imaging satellite up there by putting something at a much lower orbit while they had something at a higher orbit, which was, you know, very, you know, sneaky. And that could be because this thing has a very strange orbital path to it. And. You know, one of the best theories I've heard, and when I say best, meaning I don't effing know things about, you know, what really satellites, you know, military satellite assets, what they need to be doing. But what I heard, which is kind of interesting, was that this one, because of the way the orbital was seemed to be uh, put on, was designed for watching shipping traffic around the world. Wow. Oh. And, you know, you have we have a problem right now where like, hey, who's sending oil tankers to North Korea? You right. know, who's doing this? Who's doing that? And that's a very and if you because part of the way we monitor shipping is we use, you know, like tracking, you know, things they have, you know, GPS signals and tracking and report their positions. But if somebody does not want to because you hear about this, like they intercepted a tanker, like how how is that a hard thing to do? Turns out the ocean's very big. Yes. <laughs> and, and boats are very small. Uh, turns we, out it's hard to find We lost the airplane over the Pacific. You know, we never found that. It would maybe found debris. Like, you can lose an entire airplane and whatever, not know. And so, uh, hold on this a second. Pause that for a second, Bryce. Um, so, anyhow, uh, that could be a very interesting thing. So, who knows? It may not, we might know for 30 years what happened. So. That's crazy. Well, I'm anyhow. glad that the Twitter mentions no. I'm glad that the rest of Twitter is, is so confident in exactly yeah. what happened. Yeah, so there is a uh, – I sent Bryce a link. And so uh, China has been aggressively pursuing a space program, and they've decided to uh, – China, like Russia, a lot of the places they launch from are actually uh, in very, very inland. You know, they're they're – not out at we we have a wonderful place in Florida to launch from, and now they're going to be doing like Brownsville, Texas, and also in the California for doing different kind of orbital inclinations. We also have Wallops Island, etc. A lot of what China and Russia they kind of sort of launch from land. Here's the problem about land. Oh, that when stages just fall to earth, they can land on people and things. Yeah, people live there. Yeah, yeah. people live on <laughs> land. <laughs> So here's video. There was a recent Chinese launch, and this is what's going on. Watch, watch uh, in delight. Is this? And this is an uninhabited area, but there are people oh there. Oh my gosh! gosh. Um, and the, and the snark is like, yeah, they're trying to reland a booster too. Oh wow! Holy what? moly! Wow! Just, just roll the dice, huh? Like, ah, oh, we'll see. Yeah. Wow. Um, let me find. Uh, I'm going to send another link to Bryce here. I'm going to send you another. This is a. So, I mean, clearly from the reactions, uh, people were seeing it even as it was falling. Uh, so they probably maybe even knew uh, or were watching for it for when it took off. I think they're pretty close. I think they could probably pretty much hear the, the rumble of that thing. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, yeah, you might even have audio. Holy crap. Wow! So there is a flaming booster on fire, and there is just like a a, a a a a real dank Instagram picture of just like, oops, I saw this flaming booster in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> 
that you're like across a road. It's like it does look like then, it's on a road. Uh, and there's I guess another one again, trailer. uninhabited areas, guys. Uninhabited areas. Uh, I just said he, he's gonna get the link. This is this is another one. So, um, uh, oh, I remember us reporting on this one a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. it's where a booster, an engine, fell into some dude's house. That's so crazy. Yeah. Holy crap! And so that's just like uh, uh, they they don't have the uh, water side or ocean side launching facilities to do this, or they just don't care, like. Well, yeah, primarily what happens is that, like, in the case of Russia and China, because their space programs really, really are arms of the military, really, really are like NASA, NASA, we created NASA to be the civilian sort of space agency and is very separate because these are military parts of the military. They put them in places where you'd want to do testing secret stuff, rockets, you know, like, you know, and the idea of like missile technology, et cetera. And so they're super, super secretive because part of the way they justify their expenditure on this is they are building military technology. Mm -hmm. um, gotcha. You know, who, the, the pilots on these things are all military, active military, whatever. And we do that. We'll have the space shuttle, too. We'll have a lot of, you know, you know, Air Force people, things like that. But a lot of them can be, you know, NASA has their own civilian people, whatever. And the point is military and so that's why these secret places right now so just accessibility russia you know there's you know to, to launch from like kamchakta or something like that you know it's middle of nowhere mm -hmm. i mean that that's that's yeah, it'd be a good peninsula for launching stuff and i'm sure they've probably done some kinds of launches from there and china um you know we'll we'll see where things so if they have a lot of coast they could but you know yeah Wow, I mean, I, I mean, imagine that one just whistling into your backyard. Like, oh, and and the fuel for that, like those stages are probably hydrazine, and hydrazine's like super, super, super toxic to people. That's wow. like just super toxic. So, uh, so very good powerful. thing this photographer ran right up to it to take a picture of it. Yeah, yeah, not a good idea, but anyhow. Um, I mean, hey, but also. Dank Instagram. <laughs> yeah. it's progress is made. Ground. You know, rockets hard. You know, got to explode a few things. So. Holy crap! I think oh, I think we can we can safely say that that one did not go as intended. Well, I don't know. I don't know if the upper the upper stage may have made it. I don't know about the huh? boost. Yeah, you know, so. And then with that, just just uh, what the Chinese military calls a party favor. Yep. Yep. So, uh, gentlemen. We used to mm -hmm. do a thing on this show. I remember this thing. Long ago in the before time. When yeah. the th three hosts did gather and worlds were made and unmade by their reckoning. Yeah, it was called, a, called Journey Quest, I believe. Yeah. Oh, I think it was called Journey Quest! Previously on Journey Quest! The concept of... A resistance to fire is what is old as history itself. I lift the corpse and bring it out like a dish towel. So as you spray your gas at him, actually, the flame is on the edge of the flamethrower. It does ignite, and a big fireball engulfs Congo. Gentlemen, we have a problem. There's a roadblock. Man, just outdoing himself with these recaps. This is amazing. Amazing. Uh, so you guys, you you... Finished your first match. You were successful, and you hit the road. Oh, th that's right. This was the small town that we were kind of a kind of a ramp up for right. for our, yeah. our battle. Because if we if 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 we lost, we would have had to go rebuild our image in 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 the Mexican minor leagues. When when really what we want to do is get out to California as fast as possible as top tier attraction combat talent. Yeah. So you're driving along in your RV. Uh, I think Brian may have actually kidnapped some children from the village you set on fire. I, I, I prefer the term liberating. I, 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 I'm setting them free. Well, except but now I, you're in charge of them. But well, you're... I mean, you know, giving them a better life is what I'm in charge of, you know. Uh, that, we, that we know of. Also, I, I think we're, 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 we're off to Bryce Vegas, right? Yeah, you're off to Bryce Vegas. Off to yeah. Bryce Vegas. So you're driving along in night RV. And every time you turn it back, you look in the rearview mirror, you see the flames of the town that you set on fire. Uh, mm -hmm. I mutter under my breath, another one bites the dust. And, and every nod. now and then you see a little flame run away as somebody on fire tries to flee the town. And how does it you make know, you feel? Tell you what, it's a, it's a party favor. I mean, look, man, uh, uh, we, 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 we killed it, man. We burned that mother down. Dude, nailed yeah, you, it. Good you, show. You it. They won't forget well, I mean, this look, one. 
uh, obviously this is not a, a, a nice world, you know, <laughs> like there's there's some ugliness in this uh, post apocalyptic hellscape that we found ourselves in. What's important now is that we're off to Bryce Vegas and then from there, hopefully California. So you come to a roadblock. All you hear is there's a roadblock, right? And you're like driver says, hey, roadblock and your agent, your agent. Uh, Jimmy, what's his face? He's like, hey, yeah, guys, uh, looks like we have a little bit of a problem. And you look out the front of the RV, which is how you would look to see what's on the road. And there was like some big concrete blocks, big concrete, uh, like roadblock. Like this is a serious roadblock. F- fans, they're fans, Justin. They probably just want an autograph. Heard how we killed it. Uh, all right. Is, is there anybody else there or is it empty aside from the blockade? Uh, you see about 20 people standing on top of the roadblock good turnout. With, with rifles. With rifles. Yeah. All right. All right. Like, uh, let's, Brian, let's hop on out. Right. Let's just go. Let's go talk to them. I'm sure it's a misunderstanding. I'm sure they're just fans. They want to take some photos, selfies. It takes a little longer. They probably have to draw a sketch of us standing awkwardly with our arms over with them, but uh, it'll be great. I'm just going to let you know right now, Brian. If they want the kids, we're giving them the kids. Yeah, let's put a pin in that. We'll let's just, I just want to let you know that's just, just that, that put... offer. That's opening offer for me. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's just, okay. Let's let me do the talking then. So I, I quickly walk on out of mic. I'm like, howdy. How are you guys? How uh, long days and pleasant nights? You hear the sound of like a metal door closed footsteps and somebody walking around the roadblock is it what, what time is it dark it's dark it's dark okay. it's dark Got there's it. a moon out though and it's still the glow of the town on fire and back i think there was like i think there was an oil refinery behind there too which is now uh, caught on fire I, and... I really quick take my one good hand and do that thing where i breathe into my hand and then inhale to figure out if i have bad breath because i don't want to make a bad impression well, you look up and you see a guy, a lanky guy, about six foot five. He's wearing one of those leather jackets with the tassels that hang down there. Oh, lots of turquoise. Nice. Like, gentlemen, gentlemen, I'm Rusty McNeil. Rusty McNeil. Hey, Justin, it's Rusty McNeil. Hey, Rusty, you want some kids? No, hey, t- Justin, I told you. Oh, folks, those are them just rumors. Anyhow, let me point on over here to my right, which would be your left. And if you notice the flame and glaze while you were staring at my roadblock, you maybe did not notice Rusty McNail's Beef Jerky Emporium. Oh, my gosh. I love beef jerky. Uh, 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 do you have special flavors? Can we go for a tour? Come on in, boys. And all of a sudden, the generator turns on. Lights come up, starts blinking, flashing nights. Rusty McNail's Beef Jerky Emporium, right? Right, Calliope music's playing, opens up the door, and you see bins and bins and bins of beef jerky. Oh, my God! Every kind of beef jerky. Brian, name a beef jerky. Uh, uh, v- venison. Uh, uh, or uh, uh, turkey jerky. Or, or, or uh, uh, jalapeno-flavored jerky. Brian, Brian, my son, uh, you lack imagination. That is with it just in your arm's reach right now. Okay? Well, uh, uh, fish jerky. About, what's that? Fish jerky. Oh, my God. Hey, Brian, I, I, I found this. Japanese beef jerky here at, at, at Rusty McNail. Oh, jerky. my gosh. They, this is amazing. This is the answer to my dreams. Rusty oh McNail's like, why does your beef jerky have a pig on the cover? Uh, what, 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 what is mine? But I, I, is this not yours? I, I think I, I thought I just picked it up. It, 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 uh, it does have a pig. Yeah. I assume it's pork. It's pork. Pork jerky, son. Pork, pork jerky. jerky. Get your meat straight while we have beef, ostrich, pork Pheasant, salmon, halibut, kangaroo, baboon, homo sapien. We've got rhesus. We've got alligator. Whoa, whoa, we've got about whoa. every kind of beef jerky you can imagine here. Let's just go ahead and uh, I dial that one back there, Rusty. Uh, 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 would you say homo sapien? Did you say homo sapien? Uh, do you want two kids? <laughs> <laughs> Justin, no, we can't give him the kids. He basically he'll make jerky out of them. Hey, uh, do you do you accept kids and make them into jerky? Just, uh, just, uh, I mean, just <laughs> let's just tell, just be, you know, work. I don't know what kind of operation you think I run here, gentlemen. This is a straight up operation. This is done on the legit. 
Okay, uh, sure. Uh, I, 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 start, I start to lift my shirt to prove that I'm not wearing a wire. <laughs> <laughs> and I happen to decide those local laws and ordinances. But anyhow, <laughs> we're not here to talk about my secret ingredients. Again, it is a post-apocalypse, okay? You know, waste okay, not, wait, one, not. Uh, uh, waste Rusty, me. I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to level with you here. We're world-weary. We, uh, we, we have a long way to go. We got a short time to she get there. She tries some beef jerky. <laughs> Uh, uh, listen, we're happy to go pick up some beef jerky, pay you on our way, but uh, uh, how about we go about uh, uh, moving that, that, that blockade so we can just zoom right on by after we make our purchases? We're going to move that blockade, son. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, son. All right. Well, good. So, uh, so uh, Are you a spicy buy- man? Are you a spicy man? You look like a spicy I, man. I, I lift my head up from the other side where I'm looking at all the beef jerkies. I'm like, I like spicy beef jerky. Uh, you uh, like spicy beef jerky? Yeah, all yeah. Right. No, I, I like it a lot. With the crushed red peppers on there, it's good. It's good. Oh, uh, I, got, I got some crushed red pepper, spicy beef jerky. I got the meat stick. I got the beef jerky, whatever. I'm a meat stick kind of guy myself. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it seems like maybe it would be hard to get all these animals uh, out in the wastes. I mean, you have some pretty exotic beef jerkies here. Alligator, like I'm, out in West Texas, I don't even know where an alligator would be. Well, I had a large inventory before the apocalypse. Remember that. And then traffic down this highway hasn't been what it's been. But anyhow, you want a meat? You want a meat stick? Would you like a meat stick, son? Uh, or no, you want a slab? Yeah, slab, slab me, slab me, slab. Hold on one second. Earl, get the forklift. You're oh, gonna love this. Oh my god! And you hear and there's a back room there, like those plastic sort of dividing little slats there. Like there's another part of the warehouse near. Beep beep beep. <laughs> This is all electronic sounds moving forklift, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, flashing lights, yellow lights come through here. The plastic curtain parts. There is a forklift, and there is on there a pallet. And the pallet is a large-ass slab. Wait, a large-ass uh, this, slab. This might be a little bit more than I can consider. Should I just tear off a chunk of this? or? Son, you can do whatever you want. It's all yours. All oh. yours. All yours. Well, right on. I take I take the... Uh... I, I, well, all right. Hey, wait a minute, uh, Brian, before you uh, touch blue and make it true, uh, uh, what is the uh, price on this here slab, Rusty? Price? It's friendship. It's friendship. That's the price. See, look at this. Free, it's free jerky, man. Free jerky. Uh-huh. What could be wrong? So he just gets all that. How about you there, buddy? What, what's your favorite? What's your favorite? Uh, uh, you know, listen, I, I, I kind of I like a, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a teriyaki. Myself, I like teriyaki. I like a teriyaki right. beef jerky. Yeah, teriyaki beef, like that wagyu. Uh, yes, yeah, I think I think yeah, the the the, the, the wagyu, the wagyu, wagyu, uh, wagyu. Uh, uh, Japanese so Kobe, uh, Kobe, you want, teriyaki. You want Kobe or wagyu? I'm gonna go with wagyu. <laughs> wagyu, okay. Earl, I'll J. Uh, uh, eight. I, I, I peel off a bit of my slab and I smell uh, the, the jerky and give it a little taste. Best jerky you've ever smelled. I, yeah, I wolf down as much ground, of the jerky as I can. Goes back there. Right, oh, son, do you want a meat stick or slab? Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the meat stick. Okay. <laughs> you like that, son? You, you want a beer, some ice cold to, to eat with your beef jerky? With my mouth you still like- full, I say, You want a beer so full corn? And I, beer? I hold out beer? my hand for a beer. <laughs> Opens up, points to a bunch of refrigerated cabinets, refrigerated, you know, and there's like every kind of beer you can imagine. Dude, I, I hop on my uh, from toe to toe get with giddy excitement, run over, pop open. I, I grab three bottles, two of which I put under my left arm um, uh, and, and the, the other one is under the uh, the chainsaw arm. And uh, I come son, back. Son, 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 let me get you a cooler. And he starts putting beers into the cooler. I've, I've just, I've just, I, I am beside myself with joy. It's working. I, in fact, I say so to Justin. I say with my mouth still full, it's working. It's okay. All right. Hey, uh, uh, Forklift comes in here and you're like, Justin, you're confused because you're like, is that a, is that a telephone pole? Like, like what, what the hell is this? Am I fencing? Is this Home Depot? What I just... Son, that is the meat stick. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, 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 this is. But it's very, made of a bunch very... of smaller meat sticks that are just, you know, that you can fit in your mouth. The so don't braided. worry. It's like the, the cord of meat sticks, but it's big and huge. Drops is, it on uh, your feet uh, on some butcher paper. He's very hygienic here. Uh, uh, I, I taste the meat stick and I made. Uh, I'm, I, I imagine that it's amazing. 
Yeah, uh, I, like I helpfully walk Japan, over trimming a bonsai tree on the side of a cliff as you practice your ninja skills. Yeah, I, I walk over to the beefsteak. I say, allow me to get that for you, my friend. And I and I start up the chainsaw and just sort of just slice off like it's a logging competition, a giant pizza sized. Uh, Rusty McNeil slaps his knees laughing. He, I like your style, son. I like your style. <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, Rusty. Well, you know, I'll Buy tell you what. Uh, you. I, don't, I don't know exactly how we're going to get this here on the bus, but <laughs> I think we're turning into pumpkins here, old friend. Uh, we appreciate your hospitality. It's about time for us to hit the old dusty get trail. Uh, real quick, do you, do you have like a, a luggage cart or something on wheels we could just stack uh, up we're, our. We're going to pack that up and put that on your RV for you. So when oh, you go on your way, you have nice. beef jerky. Wherever you go. That's great. Uh, well, uh, score one for the good guys. I call this a successful, successful random encounter uh, that we had out in, in the wastes. Yeah, gentlemen. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, Earl, bring in the chairs. Earl brings in three wooden chairs. Rocking chairs. Rocking right. chairs. Rocking uh, chairs is amazing little kind of like beer cozy holsters that like allow you to rock back and forth but keep your beer from spilling over. It's like as an invention of mine. Fantastic! Uh, I, I bet these would work really good in the tour bus when we're when we're on the way. Speaking of which, yeah, I think Justin's right. We really should. We're just gonna, we're Dylan, just gonna... You're gonna be on your way shortly. Oh, you're gonna great. be on your way shortly. That great. is a jerky promise. <laughs> that was a jerky. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, well, I think we're just gonna go get back on the bus. Whoa, whoa, and... whoa, whoa! I gotta tell you a story first. Okay. Do we have time for a story? Let me. Uh, hmm. Okay. I mean, yeah. we're gonna have to keep this one tight, though, uh, Rusty, because we definitely got another town to make. Just, uh, just, just have a have another another stick there, my son. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll pour I... you another beer. There is good. Yeah. The crew, by the way, the crew on the bus, giving them beef jerky. The little the little ninos of yours. Those are, they're adorable. They're out back playing with the cattle. Now, see, look at that. Everything's picturesque. Hey, you want to know what? I feel like. Uh... That, They're that's in the great, bin, playing the cattle. They seem real happy. Good. Yep. They seem real happy. Like, like you, like you just break their hearts to take them away. <laughs> Anyhow, so, uh, you know, I, I lost track of time since things went, you know, went south. Yeah, a little. Well, things got a little funny. I'd imagine time goes, yeah. it gets a little bit odd with no internet was, to check. Top of the world out here at my jerky emporium. Top of the world, my jerky emporium, and everything goes south. I mean, well, I mean. There, you know, we're, you still got the the jerky. You look like a winner. And well, I almost didn't. You see, what I had to do is I had to lock up my jerky emporium. I had to shutter it up. I had to bolt everything down. I stood there on the roof with my with my twenty two rifle. Ah, I yeah, I, I I was podcasting yeah. to nobody for for months. I, was, I didn't know much about guns. I I was really should have got some better. But anyhow, point is, I had to protect it. A lot of people try to take my beef jerky from me. Mm. They'd say, "Ooh, we're starving. Ooh, we have a bus of little orphans. We're starving. Like, ooh, we're from the government. We're starving." Yeah. Uh. Uh-uh. I mean, it's, did not let them take it. It's a free market, man. That's that's the way capitalism works, man. Mm-hmm. They can't be expected to just. You know, what, what is this? Uh, the apocalypse didn't Actually, happen I'm because a Bernie Sunday Sanders anarchist. was elected. I read a lot of that Noam Chomsky he makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Anyhow, point is, I sat there on my roof and I protected my beef jerky for everything I could. Everybody came near me. I told them, "No, come near me." <laughs> it did. I shot him. Okay. Shot a lot uh, of people. You, I, you now, like... uh, what, 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 what happened, Rusty? Because now you have uh, at least a crew of twenty, and and you you barricaded the road. So uh, now you have like a following. I fought Claude to keep keep hold of everything I have here. Then one day, tank rolled up. Another tank. Another tank, and I was surrounded. Like by the like like the army. But they were covered in glitter. Oh, and house music was playing. Oh, <laughs> they call it right. This this, this sounds like a, a a fabulous army. Uh, yeah. Well, it was shiny, and then a man stood forth. Tall man, tall man, ten foot. I don't know if it was all man. And wait, maybe wait, yeah, was he boot. possibly part machine? Maybe maybe enhanced. Uh... Look, look, machine, cyborg, what have you. Yeah. Did he have the uh, 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 exquisite, delicate chin of a Japanese host? <laughs> Oddly enough, I, I thought more of a Japanese prostitute, but you know what you're saying. Uh, anyhow, he told me I either had to make a deal with him. Okay. Or get destroyed. 
Oh, well, I mean, that that's not a very good bargaining position. Uh, no, I have no, some no. audiobooks on negotiating higher performance fees. If told that me, would told me it, would, it would take my jerky and pour him away from me, and I fought everything to keep this, and I knew oh, yeah, when yeah, I was outmatched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well... That's 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 a cool. Seems story. like a real a real tale, my it's, friend. Uh, uh, so not, then, what'd man, you do? Really, just I. I just... agreed to supply him. I agreed to give him what he needed. He let me keep my jerky emporium. Yeah, yeah. But he takes a big cut of everything I make. Oh, okay. Well, uh, giving away your product probably isn't helping either. No, uh, no, but... no, nope, nope. And so I decided, after he left, I'd get my vengeance on him. Oh, okay. well, you're, gonna, you're gonna take him out. So gentlemen, follow me. Follow me. Oh my God! We go that. through plastic dividers. You try not to pay too much attention to. You see animals, you know, being hung from hooks and stuff, and some of them look maybe peopleish. But um, anyhow, so it's not paying attention to that. <laughs> we go through another divider. Just rumors. It's more <laughs> rumors. Go into a back area, and there, sitting on a table. Gentlemen, I want you to do me a favor. Yeah. Uh huh. This is one of them atom bombs. <sighs> I got them from a military silo out there. I want you all to deliver this to Bras Vegas. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Well, so we need to bring and detonate an atom well, bomb. Uh, he didn't say detonate. Uh, sorry, Rusty. Did Did you mean for us to detonate it? Well, yeah, I mean, timer. I'm not going to ask you to press a button and make it go boom while you're there. You're not an idiot. Well, and and uh, and I'm assuming if we do this, there'll be a, a little bit of uh, jerky in it for the two <laughs> of us. You just got a tree trunk of jerky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can never have too much. <laughs> yeah. I, I look up at, at the echo of a maniacal Bryce in Bryce Vegas. You just got cause... a lot of jerky. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I know I'm, I'm a syndicated anarchist. I know I've got to work out some medium exchange of which you would like, but then it's promptly demolished that because it becomes an infrastructure and becomes a way to imprison people. Uh, oh, okay, uh, we, we, we got it. We got it, Dr. Chomsky. Uh, uh, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, uh, let's go ahead and, and, and understand uh, each other fully. You are asking us to bring this weapon of mass destruction into the center of a town that although is built by a, a, a lunatic, and believe you me, we're not going to give you any sympathy for Bryce. However, <laughs> there are assuredly uh, hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians in an area that will be murdered by this weapon, right? I mean, say if we gave them a fair warning, like we just announced that the timer was ticking, you got 20 minutes to drive away. I mean, then Bryce would just fly away on his crazy uh, Well, we won't jet tell Bryce, obviously. We'll keep it a secret from him, and he so, won't uh, know. Uh, 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 alert! <laughs> All non-Bryces, <laughs> yes. please leave. If you're a Bryce, nothing's wrong. Please <laughs> exactly. stay still. <laughs> and, then, and then he'll be like, oh, what's that? And he won't have time to, you can't outrun an atomic blast. I mean, Gentlemen, again, it's so pretty much more or less what I'm asking you to there. do. But I want you, I'm going to make it worth your while. Not just all the beef jerky you can carry or eat. Okay. Come over here. Oh, Goes over to a giant vault. Starts to spin it. <laughs> yeah, after. After the, uh, after the thing happened, you know, and uh, after I made my deal, I started exploring all around here. That's when I found myself my A-bomb. And I was looking around, and I found some other things in this military installation, and I found the special secret warehouse where they kept all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, right on. Let me show you what I found. Slides open the door. Earl, you get out of here, Earl. You're not allowed to see this, Earl. Earl shuffles I, away. I cross my, uh, my remaining fingers in the hope that it's either a robotic uh, dong or a hand door opens next time on journey ah, 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 ah. ah you're killing me you're killing yeah. me yeah so uh all right you ready for picks picks hey uh i got a pick i watched that movie i tanya over the weekend and uh it was good and it was strange because 
uh, they're they really wear on their sleeve the fact that like well you know all the parties who are reporting any of this all have reasons to claim that this part was or was not them or whatever and uh and they make it um yeah, appropriately ambiguous in the movie uh but uh uh, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, the acting is amazing. Uh, uh, Margot Robbie, had, there's just this one scene where she's uh, doing her makeup, looking into the camera, directly into the camera. It's like 30 seconds long, and you see her tear up, fight back tears, put on a big fake uh, plastic smile, and, and you felt like this was a real person and you were uh, experiencing some some messed up stuff. Uh, I'm I'm pumped to see it. I mean, obviously, uh, something very, very, you know, uh, it's always interesting whenever a story that famous has been reported on to death where everybody is alive, you know, uh, uh, is kind of put back out there. But uh, uh, I mean, certainly all the all the critical reviews are amazing for it. So I'm pumped to see it. There's a great moment uh, because obviously it's none of the real people. It's all actors. But uh, there's a moment that as uh, uh, Margot Robbie is playing. Uh, Tanya Harding, she's pumping a shotgun, firing it, looking at the camera saying, this part definitely did not happen, or I did, definitely did not do this. Uh, so uh, it was great. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's... <laughs> haven't heard uh, Haven't heard what Nancy Kerrigan thinks of the movie yet. But uh, <laughs> uh, She said I was a victim or something, something like that. She had a comment about that, kind of a quick sort of yeah. response on that. Um. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, curious, curious to see it. Uh, uh, here's my pick. I saw the new Dave Chappelle Netflix specials. And as a huge fan of Dave Chappelle in general and his stand-up specifically, I believe that the last two, Equanimity and The Bird Revelation, are not only, I think, uh, better than the previous Netflix specials that he did, they are among, I think, the strongest of his career. There's just, you know, he, he's such a, such a, such a unique voice. Even when I think uh, uh, he is being controversial, which I think these these uh, uh, all four of the Netflix specials have kind of gotten him into uh, a certain elements of hot water, uh, specifically with the trans community. I think he is fascinating. He is he is obviously a very uh, a deep thinker, and 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 equanimity specifically is one of his best. I'm I'm so glad he's still doing this stuff. I saw them too. I enjoyed them very, very, very much. Enjoyed them, and yeah, likewise, likewise. It's very, I he he, as you said, is a very much a deep thinking comedian. Like just a lot of people have fun on the surface. He's a guy you look at this like, man, this guy has really kind of gone into this and thought about this because he has kind of a different take than maybe I don't agree with that take, but man, that takes a really good take on something. Yeah, and uh, and, 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 and and sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, and just it's in point of sincerity. He's a very stern, sincere, earnest kind of guy. Well, and I think part of it is if you look at compare those specials to some of the ones that he did earlier, he's obviously fascinated by race and roles in society and and compassion versus non compassion. And what's fascinating now is that not only has he trans, he has he has gone into this new stratosphere of wealth and influence, but also he has kind of shed this element of shared persecution that he had in some of his earlier specials. That was kind of what rooted everything together. Uh, and, and now to watch him kind of uh, turn into this unknowable object is fascinating because a lot of comedians can't do that. You know, uh, uh, you know, Richard Pryor was never really able to, Eddie Murphy was never really able to come to grips with the idea that they were no longer the guy that they made that made them famous. And Chappelle, I think, has done a great job with it. Yeah, I think that because he, he's still aware of like what. So he, you know, he, he knows he's rich. I know he's rich. And but it's funny because you watch one of them, he talks about how rich Kevin Hart is, you know, kind of in comparison yeah. and sort of puts it into perspective. But, uh, you know, the the but the, the idea that he's it's still different. Things are still different. You know, in his house, he's still a dad trying to deal with kids who, you know, like Kevin Hart more than him or whatever. And you know, the other kinds of challenges he deals with. So very, very, yeah, I enjoyed that too. Uh, my pick, um, I've picked this before and I'm going to pick this again. Uh, if I, I use Google docs a lot, I use Google docs for, you know, I, I write using, you know, whatever I prefer like Scrivener or whatever, but when it comes to doing a lot of stuff, 
Um, you know, if I have to collaborate, et cetera, I do that. And I'm gonna tell you, one of the things I think that a skill that is really worthwhile is learning how to do a spreadsheet. If you do spreadsheets, you're like, yeah, of course, that's like the most basic thing in the world. But if you don't use spreadsheets, you don't know what you're missing. Spreadsheets are an incredibly powerful tool for predicting, for estimating, for seeing things. I use spreadsheets for uh, my books, right? So like I have where I see like how much how much revenue my books are making, my own self-published ones are making on a daily basis. I look at to see, I calculate what my ones I work with other publishers where I get those statistics for that. So I know almost on an hourly by hour, hour by basis what revenue or whatever's coming in from. Not that I need to obsess and look at it that much, but it certainly helps for me in planning and running a business and understanding these things and figuring out how I need to apport my time and promote and whatever. And it's funny because like I'll deal with my agent like, oh yeah, you know, we, we you're, you're getting this royalty thing and it's going to be this much. I'm like, yeah, I know. Well, how did you know? Like, I have a spreadsheet. I plug these points in there. You know, I follow this stuff. Um, and I do that with other things. I have another project I'm working on that's uh, a technical project and a lot of different spinning, a lot of different factors playing into it. And, you know, a spreadsheet allows you to put data here, put data there and do some math and give you an answer. And you can say, oh, yeah, this is doable. We can make this thing happen, et cetera. So, again, as artists and creatives, we tend to avoid things like spreadsheets. But spreadsheets can be a tool that can give you a lot of power to predict and understand what's going on, not just financially, if you're writing a book and you want to keep track of how many words you're doing per page per day or whatever, it's just another, it's a really, really useful tool. So there you go. Uh, dude, I'll tell you what, spreadsheets. I, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, John, who I, I work with on the contender and, and a bunch of other stuff. He is, that's his, that's his happy place. He yep. just falls into a pile of spreadsheets and wraps them all around himself to make them warm. <laughs> well, you can, you know, if you want to build a business, you know, I have friends that, you know, have that find themselves often in like really, really, really dire straits. They'll have large amounts of money coming in and it doesn't come in and whatnot. And you don't you're like, well, I think I'm OK to spend this much this month. And, it, you know, it's like you got to put that data, put that data in some tables, take a look at there, spread that out. See there. And Jeff and I'm going to point my point is. Jeff Bezos is now the richest person in history. Okay, mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos is worth like $106 billion, right? Amazon is a company that functions on margins, 2% here, 3% there. These tiny little margins, and that is often very much what makes a business successful. Uh, we've all learned this. The three of this is, could be a good after things discussion, but we'll put it into weird things for right now, is that, you know, we've all sell stuff. Justin, Brian, and I all sell stuff. We all do things like this. If you get your shipping and handling wrong, what you tell a customer what it's going to cost to ship something and forgetting what it costs to pay somebody time-wise to do that, you're like, oh, you know, I've got a little margin. It costs me only 30 cents here or whatever. That adds up. Yep. That adds up, you know. And, you know, and also being able to know like, oh, you know what? Because I save my money here, I can lower the cost of this item here. Pardon me. You know, yeah. these things make the difference between business succeed and fail. So that's my, my thought. Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Uh, gentlemen, it's been weird. All right. Uh, I'm going to run to the restroom and cool. find out what the dog was barking at, and I should be back here momentarily. It's weird that they're in the restroom barking at something. <laughs> Very cool. uh, I do have an out at uh, the top of the hour, though, uh, uh, at, at 2 o'clock Pacific time, 4 o'clock Austin. Oh. I was gonna say eight minutes. Oh yeah, not not <laughs> even. No. Okay, we'll be good. Did you have a good weekend, Justin? I did. I did. It was nice to not go in places. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. You get back and uh, can, can kind of you know, cool off. Yeah, you know, watch some uh, watch some Netflix. We watched uh, a couple episodes of the Toys That Made Us. Yeah, do you, how do you like that? Uh, it's good. I mean, it's very kind of a, a basic cable infotainment kind of programming, but mm. certainly uh, uh, it's just like kind of a fun stealth business doc. Like it feels like something that you would see on like CNBC or something like that. Oh, interesting. Huh. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, um, that. Hearing you describe it that way reminds me of that other Netflix 
document. I, I don't even know that it's really a documentary series, but the um, Shot in the Dark. That story about the uh, the I don't know what they're called the the uh, Nightcrawler guys, the guys who go out and and sell. Oh yeah, yeah, new yeah, stories. yeah, yeah. I turned that on because I really I had just recently watched Nightcrawler, um, and like that's a that's a that's a basic cable ass looking show, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you got to figure that a lot of those people that would be making that kind of stuff are now pitching Netflix, and Netflix is like, hey, look, if it fits our <laughs> spreadsheet on what Netflix wants, then Netflix buys. Sure. Uh, it was just it was just super weird because, I don't know, I've never had that experience with a Netflix show of, like, turning on me like, oh, this is, this could be on X channel, you know? Yeah. Um, which is fine, you know, like, I, I mean, we were... We're at, you know, when when we were when I was at home for the holidays, we spent a lot of time at different, at various houses, and some people only kept on, you know, uh, the Discovery Channel or the History Channel or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um. So it, you know, uh, yeah, that it makes sense. It was just, it's just weird because that movie is so that the the movie itself is totally different, but yeah, it's. It's weird because that's like Which the movie? only like uh, direct way to describe it. Uh, yeah. We're talking about Shot in the Dark. Oh yeah, the Netflix series. Kind of, it's the same occupation as the guy from uh, Nightcrawler. All right, I'll, I'll BRB. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yes, W. Scottus won. There will be cord killers tonight. Yes. Oh, they didn't do DNS today. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. You, me, Bryce, and the other guy. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. great. Um, and uh, it sounded like Justin had a heart out as I was leaving. Yeah, at uh, at four. Okay. That works for me. Oh, I shouldn't have closed that Gmail tab, but I closed it ten tabs ago. So now it'll yeah. just be. Let's just open up a new one. Did you see that Paddington 2 has 100% positive reviews on Rotten Tomatoes? I didn't, but someone was saying it was pretty, uh, I see you said it was pretty, uh, quote, pretty damn great. Yeah. Audience score is 91% liked it. Huh. And then, but, but critics, 150 positive reviews. That's crazy. That First thing there. I think when I see that is I go look to see who is the director, and I know they are going to be getting, you know, all sorts of opportunities. You're going to see them do something bigger. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you get a chance to see the other email I sent you earlier, Andrew, from Josh? Uh, I scanned that. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Uh, do you have a preference on which one you want to do, or what? if you want to do one first? Let's do the first one, the, the one we get received first, first, and then we can do that one. Okay, from Ken. Yeah, uh, Pain on Paddington had a 98% review from critics. Huh. Wow. Directed by Paul King the Seventh. Do you think it's that's a, a factor of like there being a different, not to say scale, but a different, um, I mean, it's a kid's movie, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Well, and and also keep in mind that Rotten Tomato skews. Um, you know, if a movie is generally pleasant, you know, it will. Because I, I remember, like when Fight Club came out, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was a divisive. You know, Fight Club is a better movie than Finding Nemo, but Nemo had ninety five percent or almost a hundred percent positive reviews. Yeah, because um, it was less polarizing. Anyways. I'm really surprised that the the. The polarization of Rotten Tomatoes hasn't driven more people to like Metacritic. Yeah, they they do different things, right? Uh, Metacritic gives you a more precise target of the it, aggregate of it everyone's aggregates opinions, scores, yeah. but yet there's a, something about the simplicity of like, well, in general, everybody liked it. Good job, you know. I guess so. Though though you still get that with Metacritic. Metacritic will still give you like yeah a number, but it's not. A, it's still not a binary. It's like. Yeah, it's only got 89 for Paddington here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you guys ready to do? Yes, sir. After things? Oh. Let's do it. <laughs> right, oh. Let me pull up the damn email. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm like, yeah, I have it. It's, uh, I sent it to you on January 8th. If that helps. 
price. Oh, by the way, can I get a plug in? I uh, yeah. was on Current Geek last Friday. Oh, right and on. So that episode was out. And it was a fun time. It was me and uh, Andrew Christensen, Christensen from the Metcast. Why don't we do that plug during the actual podcast? So. But, I mean, eh, it's fine. If anybody's just, just people who are listening. You know. I'm going to give. Ready? Ready. Take it away in three. Yeah. Welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Uh, traveler Justin Robert Young. Hey, gang, it's me. And our producer, Mr. Bryce Neshcom Castillo. Hi. Hey, Bryce, uh, where can we see more of you or hear more of you? <laughs> well, I was on Current Geek this past week. If you go to, I think it's currentgeek.com. Uh, I had a good time with, uh, with Thomas Scott. <laughs> Enough with your shameless <laughs> plugs, Bryce. Jeez. Just like, guys, please, let me say this during the show. Please. It's my conditioner. I walk off the set. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'll fair no, Bryce does a lot of cool and interesting things, and we're too busy talking about ourselves to sort of acknowledge that. So, yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. Not, uh, not clear so what just happened. Came in a while ago, and we're like, oh, we got to punt this one for when Justin's here because yes. I mean, Brian and I could totally answer this, but uh, I thought Justin's take might be really good on this too. What up, After Things? This is from our good friend, Ken Paley Shock. This past year, I've had a taste of doing a live podcast. It's one of those things that simply came about through my inability to say no. In hindsight, I'm glad I went through it, and I think I should take more active roles in seeking out such opportunities. I'm not looking to make a fortune. Ideally, I'd be able to pay for the modest venue. I noticed Justin has been active setting up live shows, and I imagine Brian and Andrew are no stranger to this sort of thing, too. What's your approach to setting one of these up? What lessons have you learned since doing these? How do you find decent venues for starting out? We're talking about a comedy podcast here, basically a tighter stand-up set with some audience riffing and maybe a sketch. Ken. Um, I would say that nowadays the the big question that every venue is going to have is how many people can you bring? Like, wh how big is your megaphone? Uh, is it is it? Will I sell more beer because you're on stage talking than I would by just leaving music on? You know. Uh, but if you're not there, then what you're going to want to do is piggyback to some established something or other that's happening. Uh, I know that when I first got started. I would perform during the band break for the the, the Asylum Street Spankers, and it was a natural fit because I was doing vaudeville era uh, content, magic and comedy, and and to fit their, you know, blues uh, depression era blues show, um, and that's just a matter of asking. Talk to people who are there, and then you don't have to try to wedge yourself in, but instead say, "I've got this thing. I'm reaching this number of people. I think it would be very good to do it for an audience." and ask them for advice. And oftentimes, you know, if it's appropriate for them to say, do it here, that'd be great. We'd love to. That'd be good, great to get the word out about our venue. But, uh, I mean, that's where I would begin, right? Well, yeah, it kind of sounds like he wants to do something regular, too, which is which is a, a different thing than what, like, I'm doing, where, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Philadelphia for PAX Unplugged, so let's try to set up a... Uh, a, a, a venue where I can do a live politics X3, right? And I think we did a suggested donation for that and wound up probably making around $100 over what we had paid. Uh, got about 20-something people in, which was good, which was better than what my fears were. Uh, and then, you know, in March, I'm doing a live politics, politics, politics here in San Francisco, and that hopefully I'll be able to draw you know, closer to 40 because that's how many seats there are and that'll be a paid ticket. But there's like not a, a, a venue where, you know, we are, I'm doing anything on a regular basis. That would really be more of what either Brian said, you having a relationship with a venue or you having a relationship with another event for which you can be a part of. And keep in mind also that, that I, I think what you're discussing, uh, 
is is the middle ground to take you there. I think you have to start with a one off here or there so that yeah. you have that experience and, and you could point them to something like it will look like this and then they could see, you know, the big crowd or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I don't know that he, and, and I I don't know that he said that he wants to do it on a regular basis. I think he's just in I think in reading this again, it just live shows. So just even even talking about doing a live okay. show, I'd say, um, here's a challenge. Putting butts in seats. That is the you know, I was just in Las Vegas this weekend and, you know, talking to friends in the business there. You got famous names and they've got theaters that, you know, thousand seat theaters. They've got to put butts and seats in every single show. And that is a challenge. And you can go to a venue that say, yes, we have seats. But as Brian points out, they want to know that you can put butts in those seats. And that is a that is. Are you at the point? Will people show up to see you? OK. And if the answer is I'm going to say the answer is. Probably not yet. Probably not yet where you're not going to get more than a few people willing to come see you. So you say, OK, how do I do? A that doesn't mean oh, I'm sorry, you can't do a live show because your mailing list isn't big enough to get people to show up to do it. That takes time. There are comedians, there are famous comedians that have big mailing lists and they still have to struggle to get people to show up because there's so many other entertainment options there. Now, what Brian talked about piggybacking or you could play that into another thing is you combine what you do with a couple other people because you're like, you know what? Between my friends and people really like me, I think I can get eight or nine people to show up, which doesn't sound like a lot. You do a thing with three other people and you say, we're going to do a combined live show and everybody's bringing in eight or nine people. Eh, now you're at 40 people. Yep. You know, that's one way to approach it is to say, hey, I got a small audience. You have a small audience. They'll come see me and they'll stay for you. We can do something bigger. And that's kind of like how conventions work. That's how a lot of things work. We're like, no, we can get a little people here and a little people here. But if we have the venue, we can justify it. So think about doing that. I would say, too, if I wanted to do what you're doing, I would probably go to like right near here in Burbank where I live. I've got at least one or two places that have like that are have board games. They're nerd hangouts. So these very, very big nerd hangouts. Right. I would look in in the very small venues and I would look to one of those places. Say, Hey, listen, Tuesday night, can I pay you 50 bucks to have, you know, to be able to advertise? I'm going to be here. I'll have, want to have it for two hours. Anybody who comes in to play, do whatever it's going to do. I'll pay you 50 bucks for the hassle or I'll pay, you know, split the door or whatever. They might be willing. I'm going to invite my friends, whatever, but I'll pay you for, you know, the inconvenience, whatever. They might be willing to say, yeah, sure. Cause it's, you know, it's a slow night. Do people come in here, whatever. And then it's just, it might be an option to do that is to say, hey, can I do this here? Go look for some of these nerd venues. So one of the other keys is to make sure that you don't go don't get a fixed idea of how you want it to be and ask for permission to do that with a thumbs up, thumbs down thing, because nobody nobody will invite that kind of hassle and trouble with no defined benefit. Instead, what you could say is you're like, hey, uh, I know it's important to you at this venue to have lots of people here. We would like to do a live show. Is there anything we can come up with together that would get us doing our show in front of people that also also would benefit you and uh, by by phrasing the question as open-endedly as you can because there's a bunch of different success conditions everything from maybe they're like yes we'll put a, your name on a marquee you're our in-house podcast band uh, to to some kind of counterintuitive well th basically you don't even know what clever solutions are waiting for you so you want to come in with the remembering that the only part you care about is that you're doing it live in front of an audience and that it sounds you know alive in the in the studio on the recording Think yeah. think creatively about venues. Think really like I would I would there's comic book shops near me, there's other things. If we all lived in the same city and we wanted to broadcast live, I would talk to like one of those we've got like some weird museums and so I would talk to them and say, Hey, here's the thing. We're gonna say live from here, blah, 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 blah. And tell people like, listen, you may not see that immediately people come in, but there's gonna be this awareness over time and you're gonna start to see people in the middle of the week. I heard about this, whatever coming in. That other venues you can think about, libraries have places, libraries have spaces there. If you take community college classes, you find out there's an activity center. And on college campuses, you get a lot of people, a lot of spare time at certain times of the year, not a lot of money. And they're looking for something to do that's within walking distance if it's a campus where people live near, you know, Here. and that's something too. So uh, think think creatively about venues. Think about places like, uh, you know, we used to put on lectures in magic shops. Yeah, here's a, a roundabout way to get there that might be interesting is what if uh, let's assume that your podcast is you and a partner and, and it sounds like they're uh, that you you uh, uh, try to be funny or whatever, create a segment that's only three to five minutes long that it gets dropped into your podcast. This is the 
uh, uh, the, the news hype minute or whatever, whatever the bit is that you want to do. Then you open up if the two of you show up as a pair to uh, go to open mic nights. And then, like, nobody cares what you do. You just get on the mic, and, and you, you're like, hey, we do a podcast. We're ju- This bit will be three to five minutes long. It'll just be a piece of, of, of our big show. Hopefully everyone will enjoy it, and it'll go well. And then uh, uh, do that a few times, and if you resonate with the audience, if they like it, then all of a sudden you are in a position of power when you talk to the bartender and say, hey, would you like us to do, like, a whole show here on a Thursday night or whatever? Um, but basically... As long as it's nothing but empty promises or in, in hand waving of what it's going to be like, as long as it's not concrete and tangible, it's going to be harder to get somebody to commit their resources. Well, to that. I, also, you know, when when the, the live show I did in Philadelphia came through a friend, it was a coffee shop that was closed past like three o'clock in the afternoon. So to do a show at seven o'clock, literally all I had to do was uh, uh, just pay for the hourly wages for the ladies to stay there. And so they sold coffee. They made money on coffee and, and little uh, uh, food and stuff that they sold. I paid for the other two ladies to just be there. And that was it, you know, and they were very willing to make that deal because, you know, it got the, the baristas a couple extra hours and everybody was happy. You know, we didn't wreck anything. It was, uh, it was, it was all good. Uh, you know, now that involved me bringing, all my own sound stuff and everything because it was not obviously like a venue venue but for doing a podcast that's fairly simple you know they, they, there's not a ton of uh ton of uh, uh equipment that you really need to bring and there but, are but there are quirky venues in austin texas there was a, a a pretty famous radio show that would always be at Threadgills, uh which is a restaurant that's renowned for its uh, chicken fried steak so half the people there were there just to eat because well you know they're hungry it's lunchtime and then there was just randomly a five-person radio show happening in, in the corner over there there they're absolutely and like you could do like hey we got all these little donut shops there's mom and pop donut shops here and you know, you'd think like, you know, like, ah, it's not it's not my ideal venue, but you can get people in there. You could do some like, oh, we're going to go. We, could we go do this seven o'clock at night? Go do this, you know, at your donut shop and do this. Bring an audience, whatever, because, you know, also because it's great because people buy donuts. You have you think just think differently about venues. Some of the most successful stories in entertainment are people who think differently about venues. Siegfried and Roy did magic on a cruise ship when nobody was really doing magic on a cruise ship. They go to Las Vegas, and it turns out Las Vegas was a perfect place to do big, huge theatrical magic shows you hadn't since the, seen since the days of vaudeville. Okay, uh, Cirque du Soleil, uh, Guy Liberté, Liberté. Um, he is a billionaire, a billionaire who took acrobatics, human sort of stunts, called, put it under the mantle of the circus, had a road show, took it to like the Fringe Fest in L.A. Next thing you know, people are like, this doesn't belong on the streets. This belongs in a million-dollar theater with high-end lighting systems. And now there's Cirque du Soleil shows around the world because they thought very, very differently about venues. You know, Kevin Smith with his podcast, The Smodcast, has moved around L.A. from a couple different spots, you know, as far as where he does. But you think differently about environment. Uh, Jay Owenhouse is a magician in the Midwest. I mean, from Bozeman, Montana, that probably has the largest touring magic show there is right now next to like Masters of Illusion. He goes into high school auditoriums, builds his own stages, has a stage, has a portable stage that pops up that looks like a Las Vegas stage when it's fully assembled. He's doing large scale illusions. He tours in towns that don't have theaters because he can turn a gymnasium into a theater. So just think way differently. It's like, where is a place where I can have people? And that somebody wants me to bring people there. Yeah. Uh, re- reconsider all the obvious things that you can in your story. Like, well, obviously, I, I, it's going to cost money. Like, mm-hmm. is it? Are you sure about that? You know, it's like, yeah. obviously, I'll need to get a whatever. Like, do you? I mean, just, you know, the more the more you uh, give yourself the flexibility to question everything, the more inventive surprises you'll, you'll come up with. Yep. Time of day also matters a lot. You mm-hmm. know, th- there's a lot of these places that if you're doing it on a Wednesday – it's going to be a lot easier than if yeah. you're doing, doing it on a Friday or Saturday, right? If you're doing it on a Sunday, it's probably easier than doing it on a Friday or Saturday. And, and that's a, that's an important decision. During the day, you know, it's it's probably easier to do it than doing it at night. That's part of the reason Night Attack is always on t- has always been on Tuesdays is because it's such an unpopular night, and it's a it's a place that we could always usually keep our, uh, on our schedules. In, well, in and some... and and we do the live shows at South by during the day because it's just easier for us to literally grab a bar. I mean, it started out with. Yeah, we haven't done. Thankfully, we haven't done this in a while. Although we should probably get around to booking something. But like, <laughs> I would just fly down 
and then like day of the event just start calling or two days before the event just start calling around to bars on 6th street and just be like hey we want to do a thing and they're like eh, I, it doesn't look like we're getting bought out by microsoft uh sure <laughs> come on in and they would just do it for free because they there's a million bars on 6th street why not have one that you know has a big spike of 40 people roll in you know you can you can think about to some of these venues there might be people might not be might be indifferent to what you want to do but and they're in a certain venue where they think about it a different kind of way they go oh that would be really really cool and um and I, and it sounds sort of vague, but think about this. Like, so we, you know, we grew up in the world of magic, right? And magic shops bring in lecturer magicians to come in and lecture. And they're magicians that tour around the country, around the world, go from magic shop to magic shop or magic club to magic club and do these lectures and, you know, do okay. Don't do great, but do okay by it because, and the magic shop's a great place to advertise because everybody coming in there has got an interest in magic. And if they see a sign or whatever for this, like, oh, very, very cool. Another thing that's pretty big is bodybuilding seminars. You know, you get Arnold Schwarzenegger would go around country. He would go to different gyms. People would pay, I don't know, pay, you know, 30, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever. And you would bring in him or other famous bodybuilders to give a talk in a gym. You know, it would just be in a gym because a gym, somebody says there's a seminar Tuesday night and you're already heavily invested in working out and doing whatever you see that. You're like, oh, that sounds cool. I hadn't even thought about that. I haven't thought about the context of that. And you would never think that that's a venue in which you would go be entertained or see something. But it is. And you can just if I wanted to do, you know, some sort of business seminars or something like that, I would look at maybe some of these kind of coffee shop places at lunchtime, you know, downtown someplace and say or I would start looking. I've gone to a couple. I've gone to some events at these we work like at some of these these like these like work co-location places because mm -hmm. they often have a presentation area after hours. I've gone to see stuff there and also because their audience a lot of people, entrepreneurial minded people are there and it's a great target audience for that venue. So anyhow, just a thought. Yeah. Great. Uh, next question is coming up. Gentlemen, I'm currently trying to get caught up on your after things show and at quite a far and at quite a far behind. So please forgive me if this has already been asked. After listening to the first 10 to 20 episodes, make up your mind, you guys have reignited my passion for writing to the point I'd like to make my foray into writing books. I don't feel I have the time to write as much as I'd like, and I'm not hitting the 3,000 words a day suggested in the previous episode due to the amount of time I spend at work. I know, Andrew, make it a priority. Listening to you gentlemen, it seems as though having fans in a group of people, even a small group, can help you gain exposure while enticing others to view your work. I've decided to start joining a writing prompt group or two on Reddit to A, develop my technique and begin to write more, and B, in the event I feel confident enough in my abilities to flesh out a book, have a possible audience to market it to that already enjoys my writing. Does this seem like a p good plan to you guys, or am I jumping off the wrong point? Sincerely, Josh Wolf. P.S. You guys, effing rock. Uh, yeah, you probably got the more relevant take on this one. Well, let me, let me, okay, 3,000 words a day is a lot. That's a lot. There are days I don't do 3,000. Most days, I, most days I do not do 3,000 words a day. 3,000 words a day is a wonderful target, but do not, do not use me as your mark yardstick. I don't use Stephen King as my yards, not to compare me to like Stephen King or you to like, I don't mean that at all. But I mean, like I look at these, I look at the people who were writing before I was these giants and they had habits and patterns. I go, man, I need to do this. And it didn't work for me. Didn't work for me. You know, Stephen, I, I write from like 10 to two or whatever. I do this. I listen to rock music. I can't do that. I write sporadically. I write in spurts. I sit down. Sometimes I write a lot. Sometimes I don't write anything. Last week wrote zero, zero. And I got a book I have due by the way. Right. And, uh, uh, not contractually due, but something I told my agent I have ready. It's not done. It's not getting done. It's going to get done. It just didn't get done over that period. And then I have very good excuses for why it didn't get done. And I certainly could have fit in the time to make it work, but I kind of didn't want to push myself too much because if it were a thing that had to get done, then it would have had to get done. So on the subject of how to write motivating things like this, if you're waiting for external motivation, that train will never come. Because sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. You need to be internally motivated. You need to be driving yourself, okay? A writer writes because they want to write. I write books when nobody's paying attention and nobody ever reads them. Write because you want to. Now, you have stuff to do. You have a life. You're trying to be a fully engaged human being. 3,000 words a day is a lot. 300 words a day. 300 words a day. That's fine. That's fine. 
pick a day in which – pick a period into the future that you want your book done. I have to write a book. I have to get the rest of a book done in about 10 days. So I divide how much I need to write by 10, and that's how many words per day I'm going to write. If you say, you know what? I'm going to do – you know, forget NaNoWriMo, write a book in a month. Do write a book in two months. Write a book in two months, okay? Two months gives you 60 days to write. And if you're writing, you know, 1,500 words a day, then you're done, okay? If you can only write 1,000 words a day, then give yourself three months or whatever. Just write a little. Maximize how you use your time to get things done. You know, write every day, though. Find time. When I have a deadline, I tell myself I will write every day. I will maybe write 10 words or maybe I'll write 10,000 words, but I will write every day and I'll find that. It's like working out, you know, and we, we've talked a bit before how habits are formed. Brian can talk to you a lot about that because he remembers the details of these books far more than I do. But a habit is like, what, 40 days? How many days is it? Yeah, there's a, it's around six weeks is the sweet spot where it's like uh, pretty much if a habit is going to take on most people, it takes by that time. Yeah. So you spend 42 days writing. I had this, too, because I went through a period where I got lazy. So every day I wrote Every single day I wrote, and maybe I didn't write a lot, but I wrote a couple hundred words or whatever, boom, books started pouring out. Well, and keep in mind, I think a big part of that is give yourself permission to be bad. That's the hardest mm -hmm. thing about writing is that you want to self-edit. You want to, and you got to remember that writing and editing are two different jobs. That's why if anyone's trying to, to get to volume, uh, the best thing you could do is turn off the monitor. Open up the page, turn off the monitor, and just start typing. You're not allowed to go back. You're not allowed to fix it. You everything you're feeling as you're typing it even if you decide the last sentence was bad then just say the sentence the right way you will catch all yep. of that in the edit yeah don't yeah exactly i don't i i i do sloppy first drafts i just get everything down i just put everything down i don't i don't sit there staring at the screen if i'm staring at the screen i get up i walk go for a walk not check my phone not facebook that's the worst thing in the world you can do the worst thing in the world you can do is do something that's going to divert your attention away from it i want to go into it but I say, okay, I'm not going to make myself write it right now. I'm going to think about it. I go for a walk. I have a one-mile walk. I come back 15 minutes later. I sit down, and it works like a charm. If I'm really stuck with a couple plot points, I go get a foot massage. Come back. I sit down, and I write. That is what I think. So don't put that 3,000-word pressure on you. Do not do that because then you're always going to fail, and you're going to feel like a failure, and you're not a failure. You're not a failure. You're a person trying something new, and you're learning how to do it, Okay. You need to set yourself up for success. If it's writing just 100 words every day but doing it every day, you know, you can do that. I run the habit now. Like I had to turn in for another project. I had to turn in an outline like a list of a bunch of ideas. And I knew they were doing this week and I had a ton of stuff I had to do this week. I was driving back from Las Vegas, putting together budgets, putting together all this other stuff. I'm like, oh, I know this other thing's coming up and it's going to come right in the middle of when I want to do something else. I was out at dinner with a friend last night. I'm like, hey, give me a few minutes. I sat down, typed into my notepad, did what I needed to do, came home, spent 20 minutes, wrote it up, I was done. And it would have been several days of worrying about that, but I got it done. Take out your phone, write a little bit here. Just every day, every day, write a little. Write a little. Now when it comes to like getting inspiration from Reddit or other things, like that's fine, fine. That's not worked for me. Just, That's just not don't, what works for just me. Just don't trick yourself into thinking uh, every time I load up Reddit, there's so many reasons that I could justify like, oh, I'm doing work. I'm researching material to tweet out. I'm doing this. And it's like I just as a, it's a mantra. I'm like, I'm wasting time. I'm wasting time. I'm wasting time. This but it, it sounds work. like you found a community of people to so, do So, yeah, a writing I guess here's, here's, here's all I'll say. If what you want, if the product of what you want is a novel, right, and, and or or – you want to have a career writing the way that I've always, uh, uh, you know, helped it. And it, 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 using a lot of the, the advice of uh, Andrew and Brian is that it's, you need to first build the machine that builds the product. And that's your life. That's your work ethic. That's your, uh, focuses. That's your discipline. I am not saying that Reddit can't be a part of it. And certainly there are a million different ways that you can kind of get going in a certain way, but I would say almost assuredly that you need to at some point realize that, you know, you had the power within you the whole time, <laughs> that there is yeah. no magic amulet you need to start writing, and that ultimately these journeys are going to exist 100% within your head. So that's fine if it's, you know, a, a, a spark to light kindling. It's, it's great if you want to connect with them 
on a community level. And this is just another way that you can do it. And maybe writing just kind of a, a, on prompts is something that keeps your brain fresh and you excited about the process. But ultimately, writing a novel will always be about writing a novel and not about where, where you visit on Reddit. And I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to call BS here too, by the way. I thought of, I'm going to call BS on something here. All right. Okay? I don't have the time to do 3,000 words a day. Da, 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 da. Next. I want to go to Reddit, get inspired, go do that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did, 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 where did that time come from? Where, where, where? Well, I'm sorry. Does that Reddit time different? Is that a different kind of time? Is that, is that a, um, are you talking time? All visits are, to Reddit are, are of the most uh, efficient amounts of time, right? You know, I just quick pop in and out five seconds on Reddit. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it's it. Ne it's never an endless spiral down into an ever sinking no. pit. No, I, I'm, I'm not judging. I am. I'm watching somebody looking for an excuse because they're sitting down there and it's not happening. They're sitting down, and it's not happening. They're getting frustrated, and they're like this. And then, and then I've, I heard, I don't have the time. Then I have, I want to go to this other thing. Get a notepad. Get a notebook. Understand there are different kinds of writing. There is the keyboard where I'm going to put the story onto the page right there, and then there is conceiving, outlining notes and stuff. Are you spending enough time outlining? Are you spending enough time thinking about the thing before you commit it? Okay. If you were to make a film, do you just call up your actor buddies? camera friends show up say all right guys let's make a movie i've got the idea we're gonna go you do this 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 and this is gonna be the worst movie in the world okay and then unfortunately a lot of movies happen that way what are you gonna do you're gonna have a script well you're just gonna sit down and write the script no you're gonna have an idea you're gonna bounce things around you're gonna think about it you're gonna write an outline for the script and then you're gonna sit down and do that but the script isn't the movie the movie is a thing you you edit and put together but thing you shoot same as a book I don't sit down and go, I'm going to write a book today, guys. I got my screen open and da 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 Some people can write like that, but I can tell those kinds of books. And those books are way more hit or miss. I start with a story. A story becomes a book. The story is this is what happens. The book is me showing you this happening, okay? Start with an outline. Start with a notepad. Start sketching these things out there. Stay on point. Stay on this. Think about all those little details. So when you do sit down to write... You know what to write. You're not going, what happens next? No, you should figure that out. I know. You can figure out, you can have fun with it when you're when you're yeah. moving. But again, if you if you got time to go to Reddit and get inspiration on it, you got GD time to learn and, and learn how to outline and have fun. But if, if you took the Reddit part out of the equation, right, if this was just like a local writing group in your neighborhood, that advice would be different? Yeah, here's my advice. You're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Okay. Yeah, that's what's is that I forgot who said that, right? But that's yeah, but, but everything from financially to your weight to your uh, the amount of money that you pull in to the success, the popularity, all those things. Uh, if I hang around five wannabe writers who are looking for excuses and opportunities but aren't actually hyper motivated and getting things done, guess what? I'm going to be, yeah, you know, and that's not always true. And maybe I'm being harsh or whatever like this. I watch people go do MFA programs and writing things like this, and I and and to be sure. The quality of their work has improved. Their quality of their work in certain dimensions is absolutely improved tremendously because there are things that you have to have people tell you. That is 100% true. My writing improved dramatically when I had a wonderful editor, Hannah Wood from HarperCollins, work with me, point things out to me. I learned things I was not going to learn on my own. But you know what? That worked great because that was within the pathway of what I was doing. It was a natural evolution, you know, writing by myself, then working with editors, et cetera, like that. Had I decided, you know what, I'm going to go join a writer's group. I'm going to do this. I would not be where I am right now. I promise you right now. And, you know, I have very successful best-selling books right now, TV deals, movie deals, stuff like this has happened for my works. I have, I'm living the writer's dream right now. Had I done what everybody else does, join writer's groups, do this, do this sort of stuff, nope. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah, and we've said uh, versions of this before, but like the biggest betrayal you could do to sabotage your success is pretend there's a ladder to be climbed. Um, people yeah. who make it, they, 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 they forego the structure and comfort of a ladder, and instead they start just you know throwing couch cushions and tilting stuff up to build it as high as they can. I made a pile of manuscripts. Yeah, you know, I made a pile of manuscripts. Just, just step, step, kept doing, it and had a process. And I've talked about this before. 
write a book, read a book on writing, write a book, read. And again, if you want to go do writer courses, things like that, and you're excited, then do that. And there are good seminars. There are good stuff out there. There absolutely is stuff to be learned. And I have gone to some stuff and said, oh, that's cool or whatever. I've not done it, but I have never said I'm going to go to this group for motivation because if I'm with a bunch of other people trying to find motivation, there's motivation isn't there to be found. The motivated yeah. people aren't in that group. I remember I got invited. Somebody said, oh, I want to bring you to a networking group or whatever. And I sat there. It was the biggest waste of time in the world. I'm like, what do you think? I'm like, I could have been home doing things. Right? Well, and look, again, the machine. What is your machine? What is the health of your machine? What is the health of, of the machine that is outputting mm -hmm. what you want to create? Uh, and I, 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 I would say... You know, if, you, if you're if you doing all that other stuff, then you're probably not focusing on what did I have to do today? Or if you are, then you're like, OK, well, then I have X amount of time that I have allotted for my personal enrichment. I want to go do it. I want to be. Uh, but but you are you're leaving yourself open to be surprised, but you're not casting out randomly, tr hoping that you can hook yourself to some motivation star that'll take you where you want to go. Like you are in control of it. You are in control of your process. If you want better results, get better control. Don't beat yourself up. You're not hitting 3,000 words a day. Like I don't hit that many days, okay? Don't stress. You're not failing. You are not failing, okay? You are part of the learning process. You're at this part of this doing this. What you have to learn now is this, I have an hour. I'm going to spend this hour productively. I don't feel like writing because I don't think I have a clarity of my character or the conflict. Then I'm going to sit down with my notepad and I'm going to ask questions. What is happening? Why is this happening? Why is my character here? You ask a few questions, you'll find all of a sudden you have a different way of looking at it and then it pours forth. That's what happens with me. I'll sit here. I have to write. I've done everything I need to do for this other project. Now it's time to go jump in and write. I have an outline for the story and all this, but I have to think about on a scene by scene basis how to make it entertaining. After we're done with this, I'm going to go for a walk, think about the, that in the next chapter, sit down, write it, maybe go eat, outline the next three chapters, come back, sit down, write those out by asking questions. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. So if you want to do those other things, that's fine, but that's not what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, I mean, picks. Uh, you know what? I'm going to need a second. Let me see what I'm re reading these days. Uh, here's a pre-pick. I, I downloaded it, but I have not listened to it yet. Uh, uh, the second of the Dave Chappelle specials, he goes into a uh, uh, an explanation of why he left show business <laughs> by quoting the book Pimp, Pimp by Iceberg Slim. Uh, so I downloaded the audiobook. So we'll see. We'll see how, <laughs> how Pimp translates into the audiobook world. Oh my God! I cannot wait to hear that. Uh, uh, gosh. Uh, I'll go into. Are Brian ready? No, I actually I got nothing. Uh, I guess. Uh, uh, I Tanya, it's real great. Go see it. Um, I'm gonna go back, and this is a pick. This is something we've brought up before, and I think that there are some turn of the century, then at 19th to 20th century, turn early 20th century. America was going through rapid, rapid progress, electrification, transportation, cars, planes, everything. The world was changing rapidly. Most people were starting to move from the farms to the city and whatnot, and they had been raised by farmers and generations of farmers, and they felt unprepared for the world where they're in. They read the newspapers, watch the movie reels, and hear about really successful people, and you felt like you were worthless. You felt like the gum on the bottom of a shoe, and you wanted to succeed because you knew that it was possible. You knew that people were coming over from, you know, Scotland, Andrew Carnegie, you know, making fortunes. You knew that it was possible in this country. It was an amazing amount of opportunity. But how did you do that? Thus, there started a movement, sort of the self-help movement, the self-education movement, the idea that you could educate yourself and learn how to be successful. And there were a number of books written, and some of them were opportunistic, some of them were a little BS, but some of them really touched upon core truths. One such book, which I thought, I still think it's just a really, really neat book that's got some very, very good points that I refer to a lot is The Richest Man in Babylon, told as if it were a parable about, you know, from the day, you know, time of Babylon about the richest man there. And there are a lot of wonderful points in there. And I've made this point over and over again. The thing that sort of stuck with me was the, you know, the decision. The guy says, if I decide that I'm going to throw a pebble off of a bridge every day when I walk across it, 
if I cross the bridge and realize that I haven't thrown the pebble, I don't tell myself, you know what, tomorrow I will throw two. I walk back to the other side of the bridge, pick up a pebble, and I throw it. And that concept, that whole idea of determination, determination, determination is is absolutely, absolutely key. And that is, you know, in other books too, you know, have that, that whole idea of what is what is the idea of being motivated mean? What is the idea of having your own sense of I'm going to get things done mean? So that uh, that's one of my favorite parts about that book is that it's hard to finish that book and not believe that uh, it has to work. When, when the whole formula boils down to every morning, put 10 eggs into a basket every night, take out nine. And then, you know, you're going to be overflowing with eggs. Like once you see the the stories as they're represented in Richest Man in Babylon, it, you're just like, well, oh, obviously, if I just choose to do this, all I have to do is, like you said, uh, throw a pebble off a bridge every single day, not get excited and do a whole fistful at once, not forget about it, promise to make it up later. But instead, you you adopt that fastidious determination and it's just inherently obvious or it becomes inherently obvious that you're going to win financially if you if you follow these rules. And and when you have these habits, you know, you get there's a lot of BS stuff that comes out of there, like the secret and stuff, things like that, and which I think are actually destructive. But, you know, you do get into this sort of thing like I think like was Think and Grow Rich or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that was the one where like, you know, you find out what the secret of this book is or am I confusing another book? But you get into, you know, the idea is being determined to do it, you know, free will. You will do this thing. And, and who wins? Who wins? The more determined person wins. You know, the person who's more committed to getting something is the person who wins. And also what happens is over time, you know, you I work with people who get things done. I have friends who I like, I care a lot about. I don't work with them as much because they don't get things done. There are people who don't work with me because I don't get things done at the level they want to get things done. But once you have that habit of doing that, people are attracted to you. Opportunities come your way that you didn't realize existed. You know, you, you have know, no you idea what? how many things you miss out on. I, I think that's it's actually kind of a fascinating idea that like you can break down habits and you can break down personality traits and you can break down all this stuff, but ultimately productivity happens because like your life wraps around productivity. You, you do th things more or, or other things less because productivity is, is there. Like it starts to make decisions for you. And, uh, that's, that's a, you know, ultimately it all just comes down from your determination to say, this is what I'm doing and I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Yep, it comes down to just, and as you do that, you will find that the opportunities that avail themselves to you increase. I've been reading the Arnold Schwarzenegger biography, and it's just, this is a guy that was a millionaire before he did Conan. And this is a guy that came over to this country, he's 19 years old, barely spoke English, and made, you know, made a fortune not from because of the fact that he was, you know, he made some money because he was, you know, a champion bodybuilder, but he was, Joe Weider was paying him like $65 a week. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, he made money because, oh, you know, Franco Colombo and I like to, we can lay bricks. We'll, 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 you know, we'll make, we have a, we'll take a, we'll get a couple other jobs. We'll do this. And then we'll get into real estate because mm -hmm. real estate always makes money. And then he's, you know, you start listening, you realize like how many, you know, different apartment, you know, business blocks and things like that he owns in L.A. And you're like, oh, wow, this guy's been on it. You know, Denver, parts of property in Denver, then he's parts of investment groups of other people, et cetera. And you're like, oh, man, like this is just, you know, he started working hard doing things that you would think, why would you do that? There's not enough money there. Well, that get you to the next step and the next step. So, uh, you anyway. know what? Uh, I, I guess I did discover one in our conversation. Uh, Earl Nightingale uh, did a spoken word album called um, The Strangest Secret uh, in 1957. Um, and uh, it was the first gold record for the spoken word, actually. Uh, I'd, I'd read bits and pieces of it, but I've never listened to the original thing. So I'm going to preemptively say that'll be fun to listen to. Yeah, cool. I don't even know about that one. I mean, Nightingale Conant, you know, legendary. But yeah, he's, yeah, he's the Nightingale of, of Nightingale Conant. Yeah. yeah. I've heard like a very deep basso sort of voice. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at this up right now. Cool. So those are our thoughts and, you know, it's just, it's not easy. That's why most people don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's what it comes down to. All right, everyone. Uh, Bryce, do you have any recommendations? I'm, you know, 
sometimes I usually forget to ask you. Um, oh man, uh, you know, I, I don't. Not. I not Tanya, I, it's great. <laughs> I, I saw something really cool at PAX, but it, I don't think it comes out for a few months, and so I don't want to get people excited for a thing that they could get easily later. <sighs> yep. So keep All right. An eye out. So, hell of a tease. <laughs> hell of a tease. <laughs> Willpower is could be an illusion, but you know what? If you believe it, it works just the same. Absolutely. Gentlemen, it's been after. Dun, 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 dun. Alrighty. Hey, good shows. Yeah. Good show. uh, oh, perfect. This gives me a good time to uh, get prepped on yeah. board killers. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go grab some food and then I gotta hop on a call. So yeah. I will talk to you boys later. Good to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Thank you.